What is up, everybody? Welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. In particular, welcome here to Rockin' Robbie Live. I am your host for tonight's festivities, Rockin' Robbie Bills. And welcome to a special presentation. Happy Easter, everybody. And around this time every year, I kind of like to have a little bit of a Teen Dog Shades night. So if you're new, if you've never been part of a Teen Dog Shades night, all it means is it's the same show as normal. However, we may be talking about UFOs, aliens, other dimensions, esoteric knowledge, uh, big feet, and, and, and other cryptids and things like that. Whatever you want to talk about, it's all no holds barred tonight, because it's a Teen Dog Shades night. Let's get metaphysical. So how is everybody doing? Station and pop, pop, boom. Excited to see all you lovely people up in the room. Once you get in here, why don't you shout out and say who you are, what you doing, what you're up to, what do you want to talk about? Because we got a great show planned tonight. We will, of course, be having the DC sneak peek. We will, of course, be having show and tell. And maybe if you behave yourselves a little bit of Marvel in the 90s. We really do appreciate everybody being here, though. And even though we have a plan, grandiose, some may call it, this show is driven, fueled, if you will, by your questions, your thoughts, your comments, and your concerns. So get them in right now. What do you want to talk about tonight on the show? Let's start chatting. Let's start talking. Let's bring it up. Let's bring it live. Of course, PCP Movie Night. Let me talk about this. We just wrapped up March Madness last night over Dylan's Horror Show with a discussion on Possession, a really cool film worth discussing there, worth discussing on Blood Splatter Chatter, and worth discussing on an upcoming PCP Movie Night at some point in the future. That was a great show, but Manny really did a great coda to March Madness today with his video about the Spectre and Ghost Rider, and we... Uh, have demons. <clears throat> really good video from Manny, so everybody go check that out at Nerdtastic News. But now that March Madness is over, that doesn't mean that the cinematic madness ends, because tomorrow night on PCP Movie Night, we are fulfilling a four-year promise, and we'll be talking about the 2019 movie, Cats. So, everybody get very excited for that. I, I, I know that I am... For sure. Dylan's Horror Show is uh, celebrating Stephen King films all month long in April. It is, of course, Dylan's birthday month, so it's going to kick off Saturday night with Graveyard Shift. I will not be there, but Dylan and crew will be there, so you should definitely check that out. Also, Blood Splatter Chatter will be live um, this week, I think on Thursday, or doing something. I don't know what his next shows are. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Happy Easter. I hope you had a good weekend. I hope you had a Good Easter if you celebrate things like that. You know, me, I had, I had a good solid weekend. So Friday night, <clears throat> me and some of the crew, we went over to uh, like a localish haunt, haunted attraction. We went there at, during Halloween time. It's called Arx Mortis, right? And they had like a special spring break setup. So we went to the haunted house, came back, chilled out, drank tequila and beer and just had some nice fun with uh, good friends and meeting new people. So I met a lot of new people this weekend that I thought was it was really they were, I thought they were really cool people. It was very very exciting. So that was nice. Saturday night of course Dylan's horror show uh, working through the weekend as well and today had a nice relaxing day and the best thing about this weekend of course, was the return of Major League Baseball and the fact that the Yankees did a four-game sweep of the Houston Asterix, and I am so excited. The Yankees starting 4-0, and and we laid it on the Lastros. So that was awesome. Station, go Yankees. Ha-ha. <laughs> I love it. I really, really do. We are now going to pause officially for station identification. What do you want to chat about? Get it in. And when we come back, we'll be dealing with the first five. All right, and here we are bringing you your very own official First Five. All right, we've been going through the Marvel Masterpieces by Joe Jusco, and we're getting to some really cool ones here. Card number 30. 
31. Card number 31. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Human Torch. Very uh, sizzling image, one might say, but I really do love that Human Torch card. Of course, I'm a huge Fantastic Four fan. This is a great card and one of the more popular images from this line. There is the card for Hulk. Super jacked Hulk. Joe Jusco. Doing the Lord's work right there. This is a cool one because it really symbolizes a time at Marvel, especially for me. But there's Hobgoblin right there, obviously with the more demonic face, but that's a super gnarly card. This is a, it's a decent card, but compared to some of the other ones, it's kind of boring. But there's Hawkeye, fan favorite Hawkeye right there. And then to wrap up the first five, kind of a boring character, but a really dynamic looking card. There is Havoc of X Factor at this time. <clears throat> so looking at these cards, whoo, it's tough. I really love that Human Torch. I love that Hobgoblin. But I think the best card of the first five is... Let's go ahead and go with the classic. It's Hulk. Let's see if we can top that when we hit the final five at the end of the show. And anyway, that has been your very own official... <sighs> Five. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Let's take a look at the chat. See what is up. Do 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 do. <clears throat> GT Key Comic in the house. What is up? We got Entropy in Comics. How you doing, my man? We got Anissa in the house. How you doing? James is here. What's up? Road collecting in the house. Sledhead is in the house. Neighborhood Merc Station. Everybody, happy to see you here. Sledhead says, everyone gently caress that like button. Yes, we really do appreciate that if you do. Thank you so much. Right now we got 37 people in the chat. 37 in a row? Absolutely in a row. Now we got 38, so. That joke is over. We got Two Gun Pedro in the house. What's up, my man? Pew, pew. I hope you enjoyed March Madness, man. We got some really fun and exciting spooky stuff planned for Horror Fest this year. The name changes is in the house. Hola, what is up? Hey, circumstances. How you doing, dog? Good to see you here. Good to see you here. James Dynamite, what is up? Very cool opening sequence. Well, thank you so much, James. We really do appreciate that. That's the uh, official the PCP Teen Dog Shades Night opening. <clears throat> I put that together a few years ago. Dwayne's a pain is in the house. What is up? Name changes. He's got it right. Teen Dog Shades Night. Hey, what's up, Boat? How you doing? Sledhead every time. I wear my sunglasses at night. So I can, so I can. Something, something, something. Um, bum, bum. She's abandoned me. Anyway, no bourbon tonight, y'all. Strictly no bourbon on live streams for... Another good six months, probably, after last week. <laughs> hey, what's up, William? What's up, American Demon? How you doing? American Demon? Is, it, is this you? Is this you, bruh? Is this you who I just met this weekend? I think it might be. You let me know. <clears throat> Hot talk is Ed Piscor for me. Oh, Jesus. All right. I, I knew this was going to come up. So actually, what's funny is the... Not funny. Nothing about this is funny to me. Um... I found out about the Ed Piscor shit live last week at the very beginning of the show, right? If you're not if you're not in the know, Ed Piscor, who is a cartoonist that I really admire their work, right? I really like Ed's work. I've been covering it here on the channel. Um, he's the co he's the co-conspirator of sorts of a cartoonist kayfabe along with Jim Rugg. I'm a huge fan of that channel, um, and Ed Piscor was accused of basically grooming minor women or seeking into the DMs of minor women to, and other women came out that weren't necessarily minors or anything like that. When we talk about minor, we're talking about like 17 years old or something like that. Um, and basically he's been accused of trying to use his position to have sexual favors um, from women in order to like introduce them to maybe agents or other cartoonists and things like that. And uh, it's... <clears throat> It's very unfortunate. I, I have obviously been a huge supporter of Ed Piscor's work 
here on the channel for a while. I've met Ed Piscor. Um, I like his work, but this is very, this is very disappointing to hear from him, right? Like to hear that this is the kind of dude he is. You know, I don't know all the ins and outs of everything. I just know that it's a little creepy and it's a little unsettling and, and it's very disappointing. Um, I, I wished that, 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 that's not the kind of person that he was or to do things like that. And I don't know all the nuance and I don't know all this or that. And I'm not really speaking on legalities or anything like that. I'm just saying it's disappointing that this happened because it's pretty much probably ruined his career. It's put the career of his partner, Jim Rugg in serious jeopardy. Jim Rugg put out a statement um, basically saying he was ending his professional uh, relationship with Ed Piscor and reevaluating his business associations. So cartoonist kayfabe's done. They haven't released a video at all this week. Like since this news broke, they haven't released a video. That's unfortunate because I do believe that Car cartoonist kayfabe was a incredibly valuable resource for comics fans here on the on YouTube in the YouTube community, and. I was chatting with a friend about this yesterday or the day before, and they were like, man, it just sucks. I wish that like Jim could keep Cartoonist Kayfabe going or something like that. And I was just like, you know, that name's tainted right now, right? And there's just no way. And Jim, I think, is going to be laying low and just probably keeping his head down and trying to do what he did before, you know, and just make good comics, right? So I, I personally feel bad for Jim. I feel bad for any woman that got, you know, thrown in the midst of all of this. I feel bad for for Ed Piscor's family and his friends and his fans for having to kind of deal with this disappointment. Um, I've heard other people say this. I'll say it too. I believe in second chances. And when shit came to light about like Warren Ellis's creepy behavior, um, I felt like he has made like a very real and honest kind of approach with it. And so like, I believe in second chances and hell, he's sometimes even third. Um, so if Ed makes a statement, he's been silent this whole time. I don't know what's going on with that. But, you know, if this is something that Ed acknowledges and works on and tries to do better, then maybe one day. Um, but right now, <clears throat> it's just incredibly disappointing for a, a, a cartoonist, a creator that I loved so much. I loved their work so much. And and even their commentary on on, on comics with Cartoonist Cafe. Um, it's very disappointing. It's very disheartening. And it's just like this shit again. You know, and it just sucks. It just sucks. If it was some other buddy, if it was somebody else who I didn't like have so much attention to, uh, I would, I would probably be less bothered. No, not, but I would still be bothered by the hate behavior, but I would be less disappointed as a fan, if that makes sense. But that being said, whenever shit like this happens, it's unfortunate. <clears throat> and I just wish that more people could do better and it sucks. But I was telling my friend, cause it's like cartoons, kayfabe's over. And they were like, well, what do we do? And I said, well, it's up to us now. You know, it's up to the rest of us to like pick up that slack and step our game up and be even better than what Cartoonist Kayfabe was. I will lament the end of Cartoonist Kayfabe. And I wish that Jim and, you know, could get another partner or, or do something, but maybe that time's just passed, y'all. You know, and it's unfortunate because Cartoonist Kayfabe was actually pretty much a part of my pretty much daily routine. But you know what? It's up to us now. We got to do better. So there you go. I guess those are my thoughts on the Ed Piscor situation. My other thought is this. I kind of don't like other content creators using the drama surrounding it to kind of like build up their own channels. That's a little, that's a little, I don't know. I don't necessarily always like that. Hey, what's up, Ar Ariaga? Dynamite says, just stopping in to say hi, bought a game, uh, bought to, about to start a game of Risk with my cousins. Well, good luck. The key is Australia, apparently. I played one game of Risk in my life. Uh, Brooks bought me a Risk, or somebody, I think it was Brooks, bought me Risk. Brooks is a huge fan of Risk. So I have a copy of Risk. We played it one time, me, Brooks, and Jelani, and I kept convincing Jelani to make decisions that would fuck Brooks over, and I wound up winning, and Brooks got pissed. We've never played again. <laughs> We should live stream a Risk game or something one time. Hey, what's up, Kenneth? How you doing? James's edible is kicking in. Hell yeah, that's just perfect for a Teen Dog Shades night. 
The sled head, I agree. I mean, he needs to say something eventually, but you know what? That's on him, I guess. R. Ariaga says, can't wait for the Cats Hate Fest. Tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Central Time, here on Pop Culture Philosophers. Hell yeah, go Yankees. Circumstances out here representing the Royals. William says, thanks for posting the link. Just subscribe to Nerdtastic News. Well, station, William. That's awesome. Thank you so much. The name changes uh, hollering out for the Guardians. Do you have any Swamp Thing recommendations outside of Moore's Run? Uh, Rick Veach. Rick Veach, who they just announced, is getting a new collection uh, in comic book, in trade paperback, graphic novel format. Book one, Swamp Thing by Rick Veach. That's awesome. Hopefully, they'll do book two and actually restore his Jesus Swamp Thing issue. Um, that would be great. Outside of that, Brian K. Vaughn has a pretty decent run on it, and I really do like the Scott Snyder run on Swamp Thing. Also, there's a Jeff Lemire, uh, Doug Monkey book um, called Swamp Thing Green Hell. I'm a big fan of that one as well. Name change just says, circumstances, I don't pick the teams, they pick me. That's right, that's right. Two Gun says, I want to recommend a movie for PCP March Madness next year if you'll let me. Two Gun, you know what you got to do. <laughs> you know what you got to do. I, I dropped myself in the chat. Let me pop back up. There we go. Circumstances says, Hawkeye never deserved Mockingbird. <laughs> Shall we, uh, oh, Otani is a hot topic for me, too. Yeah, I, I, I don't really know all the ins and outs. I gotta pay more attention to it, but, I mean, they, if he gets away, if he gets off from the, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 as a spectator, it's easy to, like, look at the situation and be like, this is obvious that he knew about it and all that kind of shit, but I don't know, I don't really know, but it's interesting, but if he doesn't get in trouble and Pete Rose is still sitting on the sidelines, I'm, I'm just like, what what's up with that? Yeah, that card was sick. That version of Hobgoblin was the bomb. Hell yeah. Hey, what's up, William? Happy Easter. What's up, Icy Cold Milk? How you doing? Hope you're doing well. Happy Easter, Anissa. Oh, it is you, American Demon. What is up? Good to see you, buddy. I really enjoyed meeting you and getting to know you and your partner. Um, and American Demon is a comic book creator, and I got a copy of their comic, so I'll be checking it out soon. <clears throat> R. Ariaga says, Robbie, please include When the Evil Lurks, or where evil When Evil Lurks... In this year's Horror Fest, that movie messed me up. Yeah, I haven't seen that one, but somebody is covering that. Or has just covered that. I don't remember. One of, the, one of our channels has done that. I'll consider it. Robbie, please explain how Roy Thomas was given co-creatorship of Wolverine when he was just the editor-in-chief and not the writer of the artist. Some bullshit. Some bullshit. Basically, everybody except for Marvel and the camp of Roy Thomas is basically saying bullshit on this. It sets a dangerous precedent where now are other editors going to follow suit and start trying to claim retroactively creatorship of certain characters? Now, a lot of people that are very, you know, way more... Um, educated about this stuff, have spoken out on it, but like Tom Brevoort, Mark Wade, Rob Liefeld, tons of people, Bobby Chase, tons of people have come out talking about this, and it seems like most of everybody's kind of disgusted by it, right? So Roy Thomas has a manager, and apparently that manager has really been pushing him, um, and I'm going to name his name, I, I've met him before, um, and I've met Roy, and both of them were really nice to me, right? 
and Roy's getting up there in age, but he does seem very sharp or whatever. But basically what it is, if you're not aware, is that Roy Thomas has been recognized by Marvel as a co-creator of Wolverine. Even though it's established by all parties involved in previous like interviews and conversations that Roy said, let's do a Canadian superhero. Let's call him Wolverine. Does that mean he's cre he's a creator? No, it doesn't. And all these other editors are coming out saying that does not mean creatorship. Lynn Ween's the creator, right? Lynn Ween's widow is worried about the legacy now of Lynn's work because Roy Thomas is coming in and he's the co-creator of Wolverine. So Lynn Ween and uh, John Romita Sr., they created Wolverine, right? And now it reads Roy Thomas, Lynn Ween, and John Romita Sr. And they even gave Roy Thomas that top billing. And it's all retroactive, and it goes against the story that we've always heard from all of the parties involved, and it doesn't fucking happen until after Lynn Ween, Stan Lee, John Romita Sr., and Herb Trimpey are dead. After four of the key players involved in this situation that could have, you know, argued against this or helped out with the facts, they're all dead now, and now this shit happens? So now he's got equity in the character. It's some bullshit is what it is, y'all. It's I love and respect Roy Thomas. This is some bullshit. This is straight up some hijacked legacy bullshit is what this is. And that's just my well, that's just what I fucking feel. I got the damn shades on. I cannot lie tonight. That is fucking bullshit. Name changer says, damaging to Ed Piscor. I've seen his show once or twice. Circumstances is hopefully Jim can get another host for Clay, uh, Kayfabe. I would love something like that. I, you know, Tom Scioli's another Pittsburgh-based artist. Maybe they could do something. They, you know, Tom's worked with them before. But I, I honestly think that, it, I think it's dead. I think it's gone. Maybe he'll pop in and do some uh, Total Recall shows with uh, Tom. American Demon says, holy shit, those guys showed me how to make zines. Name Changer says, that's right, it's damaging for everyone. Sledhead says, I'm all about second chances, but you have to make amends if you can, I agree. Hey, Carrie, what is up? Let's all try to stop platforming bad people. Too many people coming forward saying, oh yeah, we knew about Ed, why didn't you say anything then? Well, I didn't. And I'm always going to talk about the work. And... I loved his work, but, you know, it's yeah, unfortunate. Sledhead says, yep, your top downs are needed more now than ever. What, it, I mean, I, I started doing those, you know, you know I've been building up to this, so it's it's interesting. I'm not trying to, like, jump in and steal it or nothing, but I don't know. I mean, we do have top downs now. Hopefully those can do a little bit. You know, they've been doing decent, but uh, hopefully they can kind of grow and start doing a little bit better. Artist formerly known as Jesse say, what is in the house? What is up? How you doing? BJ, Robbie, will chat GPT and other uh, AI stuff going on uh, kill the steal the jobs in the comic industry or will it assist humans in the comic industry? I think in the long run it's going to assist, but there's a lot of going to be, it's going to be a lot of controversy and growing pains to get there. And right now my one thing that I'm worried about is for lack of a better term, kind of like a witch hunt of people accusing people of doing AI art without any kind of basis to that accusation. So, I don't know. It's going to be an interesting few years to see how this develops, for sure. But we ain't going to stop it. Sledhead says, I refuse to play Monopoly ever again. Yeah, pretty much me too. <laughs> Tell us your thoughts on Flat Earth. Bullshit. Flat Earth is bullshit. It's not true. Scientifically proven to be false. No offense to any uh, flat earthers, but I think you're fucking stupid. So there you <laughs> oh, yeah, William, I did forget Rom V Swamp Thing. Rom V Swamp Thing. I would highly recommend that one for sure. Thank you, Carrie. Also, I did. How did I fucking forget Rom V Swamp Thing? <laughs> hey, what's up, Kelvin? How are you tonight, Robbie? How's your comic book coming along? Slower than we thought. <laughs> slower than we thought, but it's coming along. It's coming along, but slower than we thought. 
I'm currently in the writing process and yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like a week ago, I was like, I did like an hour and a half of research for like 13 fucking words of script land. Like, and I, I think maybe I'm getting too deep into it. Honestly, like I'm going deep into like all this fucking mythology and ancient lore and shit. And I'm just like, is this needed for this script of an ash can? <laughs> but no, we're still on pace, hopefully, to uh, launch the ash can at Heroes Con. So, heck yeah. All the art for the ash can's done. Just uh, some writing and formatting needs to be done. That's it. So hopefully more updated coming more updates coming soon. What's up, Chocos? How you doing? Hey, what's up, Julian? The Robinator. Cool shades, dude. Thank you. These are the official Teen Dog shades. Yeah, there you go. We got nine panel grid in the house. What's up, Easy? How you doing? How about Swamp Thing in the 90s? Well, I mean, there's they're a little bit of a Mark Miller run. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of Swamp Thing in the 90s, I don't think. So it'd be a bad idea to get him to sign 181. I mean, you can get whoever you want. Most people got like Stan Lee signing that one. He didn't have shit to do with it. At least Stan Lee didn't try to. At least Stan Lee was smart enough not to claim creatorship of Wolverine. But I think it's bullshit. And he's the editor of the book, so that's fine. Hey, we got Fable in the house. What's up, my man? How you doing? Good to see you. Hydra Asylum Comics. Got Robbie on the big screen while I work. I'll be in and out, but I'm watching Station Everyone. Jay. What's up, Jay? How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. <clears throat> Milk Bone Crusader says, I just finished Bang by Kent. It's said to be continued last issue. Did he make a sequel yet? Wasn't something kind of a follow-up to Bang? Was that subgenre? Was subgenre kind of like a follow-up to Bang? I don't know, because I dropped out of it. Vengeance says, Yo, Robbie, do you think Al Ewing will be doing a DC ongoing since he is doing a story for DC's Pride special in June? Uh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, he's kind of had a successful career at Marvel. I wouldn't put it against him. I don't think he's exclusive. And uh, I have heard rumblings that there's going to be some big, uh, big time creators announced on certain books in the nearest future. Uh, I think Bleeding Cool reported on that as well. Um, I guess he could be considered a big name, but I thought they'd be bigger than that. But I don't know. It's a possibility. Yeah, sometimes the research is hella fun, but when, when you got a tight schedule, <laughs> I don't know if an hour and a half of research for 13 words of lines of di 13 words in dialogue is, is gonna, do we have the Kickstarter up yet? No, we're far away from that. We're going to launch the ash can first and then we'll see. James is vaping on some mean bean. Vengeance says Jeff Lemire swamp thing. Green hell was lit. Yeah, I really do like it. Eric from Nine Panel Grid says, subgenre kind of follows it up, but don't expect a direct sequel with it. But subgenre itself was great. Have you looked at the Heroes Con guest list yet? Anyone you're hyped for? Oh, yeah. And the person I'm most hyped for right now is Tom Scioli. I have never met Tom Scioli. I love his Jack Kirby book. I love his I Am Stan book. I love his Fantastic Four Grand Design. I love his GoBots. I love his Transformers versus G.I. Joe. Um, I love his Star Warriors that he did, his remastering, remixing of a Jack Kirby Lost classic. Uh, I got my Witch Man apparently on the way, which he kickstarted a few months ago. So I am super excited to meet Tom Scioli, 100%. Um, an ash can is basically like a proof of concept type thing. So it's a little preview of a comic that's usually going to be smaller in size. Ours is going to have the first 12 pages of story. Uh, 
Robbie, is comic book, uh, are, are comic books a crafting job or an artistic job? A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, a little bit of both. Stefan or Stefan is here. The Street Fighter book this week was dope. Man, I left the fucking artwork in that was amazing, yo. I was blown away by the artwork. The story was all right, you know, but that artwork, holy shit. And it's not usually, usually Street Fighter Udon books, like you got a certain vibe and look. This was different. It had a rawness to it that I really, really liked. I thought it was dope. Just got the man's best ash can. My first ash can. Well, nice. Hell yeah. I had a bunch of uh, shit from the 90s and stuff like that. Hey, what's up, Billy? How you doing? Carrie says, I spent a half hour the other day trying to decide what a comic, what comic a character in my novel was reading in August 1999. <laughs> Stephen Platt is high on your list, uh, circumstances. Dude, me too. Um, he was at Megacom, but I didn't actually get a chance to talk to him when I did. Every time I went by his booth, he was gone. Um, uh, so, I mean, I went, I walked by a few times while he was there, but I wasn't there to see him. But every time I had my book and I was going to go see him, he was gone. So very excited to see Stephen Platt as well. I, I, I already got my profit issue. I don't remember. Is it number seven? It's one of my favorite cover that he did on that profit run. So very excited for that. Heroes is going to be a blast. The creator list is huge. Absolutely. <clears throat> Mike says, I watched a couple of videos of Shioli and Piscor yesterday. They have some great reviews of Miracle Man. Really, really sucks about Ed. I agree. Street Fighter Masters is awesome. Pat Broderick is a fave of mine. Who's Pat Broderick? I need a Stephen Platt number four profit variant cover for him to sign. That was the height of my childhood comic book hype. Hell yeah. Sledhead, you should definitely check it out. It's Street Fighter Masters, like Akuma versus Ryu. The artwork was great. Absolutely great. Chokos agrees. American Demon wants to know, when do we start talking about UFOs? We can talk about them right now. What do you want to talk about? You know, here's the funny thing about the UFO thing. So for the last few years, the government's been disclosing information, more and more information. Things that we were told were false, have been revealed to be true, like Project Blue Book, and then on and so forth and so on. And now they've actually shared, officially, footage of strange objects in the sky that are picked up by the Navy, right? <clears throat> and they got him on radar, and we've seen all these. Since, we've seen all these. Now, when this was all being revealed a few years ago, I remember. You know, we were talking about it here on this on the channel on Teen Dog Shades Night, and at the time, I was very excited, and I was expecting like uh, an uptick in interest. But honestly, it seems like that didn't happen. And then there was a lot of thoughts like, well, maybe it's because they know everybody's distracted by like the economy and COVID and this and that. So now they're putting it out so they can just kind of leak it out. But then some funny shit started happening during this disclosure shit where they had like the dude from fucking Blink-182 fucking leave Blink-182 to become a ufologist and start disclosing information about UFOs on the behest of the U.S. government. And I'm like, this sounds some bullshit. This sounds like some fake-ass bullshit. What are they setting us up for, right? And if you notice now, Tom DeLong is back with Blink-181 or 182. What, what is it? 181 or 182? What's the first appearance of Hulk? Blink-181 or 182. Um, so, what? Blink-182, right? I was never that big a fan of them. Um, but they're, they're okay. They're all right. I don't hate them or anything like that. But that dude leaving that band, right? And then doing this ufo shit and then like i just my bs meter just goes off goes off goes off and then not too long ago like a few years ago i watched this movie it's, it's streaming on youtube right now if you want to watch it free with ads it's called mirage men right and it's about uh what's his name richard Doty, right and i don't remember the dude but there was a dude who lived next to a an air force base or some shit right and he was picking up signals on his radio and so he was concerned, a concerned citizen, and he approached the military to basically because he was like concerned. He's like, if I can pick these up, then maybe Soviets can shit like that. Right. So they got this dude, Richard Doty. It's part of this whole operation of misinformation. Right. This dude 
convinced this guy that he was receiving alien transmissions and then they started faking alien transmissions and sending them to him and seeing him on this wild goose chase, chase to discredit him right in case he ever tried to whistle blow or or reveal something i don't know right <clears throat> and then richard doty then <clears throat> goes out and infiltrates the ufo community goes to conventions um and tries to spread misinformation to confuse everything right and then he comes out and he's in the documentary mirage men it's mostly about him um, by the way, the dude that they did this to back in, I think, the 70s, maybe it was the 60s, this dude spent his whole life trying to chase this, thinking that he was, like, saving the earth and doing, like, his his righteous duty. He wound up, like, going crazy, basically, right? And and dying, right? So, that, that, it's, that's, like, the government's directly responsible for that, right? So then this Richard Doty guy, he, like, has now since turned... He's 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 did a face turn and now he's on the side of UFOs. He is a big keynote speaker at UFO conventions. This dude who did a lot of damage to the community and to the the knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge about this subject. Right. He is now welcomed and believes in UFOs. And he has now saying that like 70 to 80% of all the stuff, the lies that he told are actually true. And he's trying to spread the real story out there right now. And once again, I'm just thinking bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. You fooled me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, get the fuck out of here. You're, 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 you're out of your fucking mind. I'm going to believe you, right? I don't trust you, government stooge. You know what I'm saying? So here's basically what I'm trying to get to. All this slow trickle and now quicker drip of information that comes from the government, I don't fucking believe it. I don't believe it. I think they're setting us up. I think they are setting us up to be fearful of an outside invasive force. Maybe that will be not from this earth. I think it's all some bullshit. I think that really, for the most part, what is going on is that we're not necessarily being visited by aliens from outer space or anything like that, but I think that we have been in contact with ultra-terrestrial beings, and I think we've been doing that for millennia, right? I believe that one of my ideas, I guess, I don't, I try not to use the word belief because like Robert Anton Wilson said, belief is the death of intelligence. So one of the ideas that I really like is that humanity has been in contact with these beings from another plane of existence or something. And it has been contextualized throughout time as, say, gods, little g-gods, or or maybe thought forms, maybe demons, maybe angels, right? Now, the word demon, of course, didn't necessarily mean from hell and things like that. These things get clouded by culture. They get clouded by mythology. They get clouded by religion. They get clouded by dogma. Um, the Blessed Virgin Mary experiences happen like that. And then when we hit into the more technologically uh, influenced society of the 20th century, I think it starts taking this UFO kind of approach, this more sci-fi kind of vibe to it, right? So I think that this is something that we interpret in some kind of way through our lens of culture and time. Um, and so I think that being in contact with these entities and learning that they're there and actually trying to utilize them in some kind of way as far as I think it's here to, to I think it's here to help level up humanity, right? Like the one, some, the, the way someone would invoke a demon or an angel or a spirit or something like that to help them out, uh, to, to deal with certain things. Maybe that's something going on, but I think it's all tied in with that shit. I don't think they want people knowing about it because I think they're afraid of individuals transcending, transcending and realizing that this government shell is all bullshit and that it doesn't matter who fucking is going to be going up against each other in the presidential election later this year because the real fact of the matter is that they win and we fucking lose. That's just the way it works. That is the way it is. And the more people kind of take their eyes off of that and focus inward and actually try to elevate and and, and, and express themselves and, le and learn about themselves and try to evolve themselves, the more that we will realize the strings that are fucking holding everything up and the more we're going to realize that it's a farce and it's absolute bullshit. Bullshit. So I think right now they're trying to once again spread misfucking information about UFOs to distract us from maybe the spiritual uh, implications of it. So I don't know. Crazy? Maybe. What do y'all think? So does that satisfy you, American Demon? 
Now, I'm not against the idea, and I do think that there's probably been vessels that are either from this earth or not from this earth that we have some societies, some cultures have found in like an archaeological dig. I do think that. So I think that like, like for instance, if there's anything that, that if there's any absolute foreign alien technology, that's not from earth or from a time before earth that we even know about, right. Of some advanced civilization, which I think is highly possible. Um, and very probable. I think that if there is any technology that we're trying to backtrack, you know, and, and, and work with from something like that, I think it's probably from something that was here a long time ago that we found. I don't know. How about that Alabama Crimson Tide in the final four? Fuck the Alabama Crimson Tide, brother. I don't give a shit. Fuck them. I'm an Auburn fan. We lost embarrassingly. So, uh, yeah, good for Alabama. I don't give a shit, though. <laughs> Fucking roll tied my ass, assholes. Anyway. <laughs> Let's see here. Love Street Fighter 2 played the shit out of that on my Genesis. Yeah, I love it, too. In fact, Mike just uh, bought an arcade one-up uh, at the store, it's one of the tabletop ones, a two player one where you sit down like the cocktail one, uh, the cocktail table thing. And yeah, I've been playing the shit out of that for the last couple of days. I've been, I'd be working. I'll go out there and be like, Hey man, come over here. Come here. They'd be like, yes. Cause I'm the manager. So like, what's a Yes, sir. What you need? And I'm like, let's play street fighter. Come on. Carrie says, wish I was going to go to Heroes. I just scored a Harbinger number one. I would love to get Jim Shooter to sign. I think he's going to be there. Yeah, he's going to be there. Jim Shooter's a super cool dude. I did a panel with him one time. Mike Sykes says, Daredevil has some of the best interiors ever right now. Talking about the Aaron Cutter stuff. I really like it. Billy Powermax says, we were going to do an ash can of the last days of the bad moon, but decided to add bonus pages instead. Hell yeah. Oh, circumstances, you're not going again? Come on. Blink 182. <laughs> <clears throat> First appearance is actually 180. Mm -hmm. He said controversially. A lot of love for uh, Blink 182. Kelvin says, X-Men 97 is good, but why call it 97 when it came out in 93? Um, it may have come out and it came out in 92, um, but it ended in 1997. So since it's a continuation from the end of the series, it's 97. We got Stu in the house. Station all. Dottie, Dottie is the devil. Absolutely. American Demon says, I've got quotes from Eric Weinstein. I wrote down, but I can't find it. What movie was it on YouTube? Mirage Men. M-I-R-A-G-E-M-E-N. Mirage Men. Bobby is in the house. Robbie said, righteous duty. <laughs> it is my righteous duty to please that booty. Let's do it. What is up? Nice to see everybody here in the chat. Dude, just look at Stargate. The aliens are the gods. Aliens. <clears throat> American Demon says, we got to get together to talk about this. There's a lot we don't know about an Earth 300 years ago, much less millions. Exactly. Next time we hang, let's do it. Let's, let's hang soon. Sledhead says the sad part is that's totally plausible. Stu says the New York Times article in December 2019 and Bob Lazar's interview really changed my life and perspective with all of this. One Collection Down says, didn't they find a planet recently that with what appears to be a city lights on it? I don't know about that. Now, I know that <clears throat> recently they found one that they thought could potentially like be from a planet that has like a Dyson sphere around its sun or something like that. 
Canadian, Canadian survivalist says CERN is opening portals. I don't know about that. I've heard that one before. I need to dive more into that, the, into that world. I remember one time I got sent this video. Somebody sent me. They're like, you probably need to fucking know this shit. Because right after this, like, it was during the time when the Higgs boson got officially confirmed or whatever. I was really excited because I'm a big science nerd. So I was, like, super excited about it. And I was, like, celebratory about it on my socials. And someone's like, you need to see this. And it was, like, allegedly an occult ritual being done outside of CERN that cracked reality or some shit. I'm like, what? Okay. That's not how, that's not how magic rituals go, but whatever. <laughs> Though, if you were going to do some kind of powerful ritual, doing it at CERN would probably be a really good idea. A lot of energy there. Hey, what's up, Sticky Ricky? Carrie says, aliens are distracting us involving the election. Welcome to Teen Dog Shays Nice on PCP. Well, I didn't say the aliens were to distract, detract, to distract us from the election. The election itself is a distraction. We're gonna, Y'all know we're about to get Biden-Trump round two, right? How fucking sad is that? How fucking sad is that? Like I said, no matter who the victor is, they win, we lose. Fucking asshats, all of them. <laughs> Which character do you pick on Street Fighter? Um, Blanca and E Honda, and I'm probably the best with E Honda. Stu says, sorry, when Lazar worked at Area 51, he said we had something like nine recovered UFOs, a couple of which were found in archaeological digs. That's nuts to me. But it makes more sense to me. It makes more sense to me that there is stuff that has been here before in the entire history of the planet, as opposed to just being a recent phenomenon that's happening. And, you know, it's not just the gods and the Stargate shit, like Carrie mentioned, but also just like... Other little things like, like look in the Bible, right? And the idea of like Ezekiel's visions and shit, the wheels within wheels and, uh, Zachariah's scroll in the sky and shit like that. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of paintings and there's some, there's this one painting. I can never fucking remember it, but it shows a bunch of like crosses in the sky and lights, weird lights and shit like that. <clears throat> it's just been documented for, uh, ages. Uh, circumstances that heroes for sure. Hell yeah, brother. Hey, what's up, Jay Sloan? New to the channel, first time catching a live stream. Well, you chose a hell of a live stream to pick, brother. <laughs> Welcome to our Teen Dog Shades nights. Mike Sykes says, any intelligent life discoveries would be huge news. The James Webb Telescope is finding cool shit every day, though. Yeah, absolutely. CERN is causing Mandela effects, says Billy. Maybe. Maybe. <clears throat> what, what, what's the reasoning on that? Like, what, 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 where does that come from? What's the idea there? Like, CERN's causing Mandela effects. What, what, what are we trying to say? We're trying to say that they're fucking with forces they shouldn't fuck with and they're changing reality. Is that what we're saying here? Very curious. Pyramids, aliens, or slaves, or both? <laughs> I'm glad it's your kind of discussion, Jay. I appreciate that. Last Days of the Bad Moon deals with CERN and the Mandela Effect. Jay Sloan says, making comics while listening keeps me entertained. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> All right, we're just getting started. We're about to take a quick break, but when we come back, how about the DC Comics sneak peek here on Rockin' Robbie Live? PCP, Teen Dog Shades Night. We'll be right back.
Recording. We're recording. Hey, gang. Hey everybody, welcome back here to Rock and Robbie Live, special Teen Dog Shades Night. Happy Easter. We're here just talking about UFOs, talking about reality warping, talking about the dangers of CERN, all that shit and more. Coming up, we got the DC sneak peek and maybe a little bit of Marvel in the 90s. And that's if we have your support. That's right. You can support us at patreon.com slash PCP. You can also follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. If you're part of Facebook, join the PCP Army. That's the official Pop Culture Philosophers Facebook group. But you can support us like these fine PCP patrons over at patreon.com slash PCP. Or with Super Chat tonight. We have not had any Super Chats today. So here's the thing. If we get $10 in Super Chats, we're going to have Marvel in the 90s tonight a special sneak peek at a future upcoming top down bottoms up video that deals with marvel in the 90s one of those books that i always intended to do for marvel in the 90s but we never did and it's a good one it's a juicy one and i'm probably sure it's a book you've read and that you know and you're going to be excited about. So if we can get $10 Super Chats, we will definitely give that sneak peek out tonight and play that for Marvel in the 90s. But the DC sneak peek is coming on the way. A little bit of show and tell later on. But this show, of course, is driven, fueled, if you will, by your questions, your thoughts, your comments, and your concerns. So once you get in here in the room, throw out a station, throw out a pop, pop, boom, whatever it takes. But let us know what you want to talk about here on Pop Culture Philosophers. Do join us tomorrow night for PCP Movie Night as we talk about cat the movie that almost ended the world back at the end of 2019 cats it's been a long time coming we promise we do it and we're doing it we're doing cats that's what we're doing all right let's uh one of the things that i started doing last week and let's do it again here tonight let's uh look at some recent comments on some of my youtube videos that's what we're gonna do and then we'll dive back into the chat. So get your topics in right now. All right. This was on the weekly comic book review. This guy said, uh, take a shot for every name drop. That's, I would not advise you to do that. I name drop a lot. If I can, I will totally drop a name. Be like, I've met this person. I've hung out with them at a bar. All right. You remember back in uh, 2022 when we uh, were re revisiting and celebrating the 30th anniversary of Image? 
Uh, we uh, did a Savage Dragon uh, bit for Image in the 90s here on Rock and Robbie Live. I clipped that out and put it up this morning. Here's some comments from that. I never liked Eric Larson art, but now I look at the Savage Dragon. It's great for the Savage Dragon book. Eric Larson, once he gets the 300, should be the one holding the crown, not Spawn. Eric Larson wrote and drew the book, and it's still doing it to this day. Absolutely. Another comment says, You mentioned kayfabe a couple of times. Just curious to your stance on Ed and his using his position to groom young girls. So we talked about that earlier. Basically, in a word, disappointing is what it is. And I this is probably something that's going to happen because these videos are from like two years ago that I'm clipping out and putting out. Finally, and so I may mention kayfabe a few times. I may have to answer that a few times. Uh, this is on my must-read list because every single content creator says the first 70 to 100 issues are some of the best superhero comics ever. Hell yeah. His drawing from back in the... Okay, his drawing from back then is so much more detailed than what it does now, but he is completely unleashed in what he does nowadays. Love Savage Dragon. Hell yeah. Here's the Shadowhawk by Rob Liefeld video. Uh, we got awesome review. Keep doing what you're doing. Digging, uh, digging your jam, dog. Well, thank you so much. Shadow Cake, because he's got some thick-ass cheeks going on in that one. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Feral with the trifecta, the hat trick, pick, cover, and smell. Has that happened before? It has happened before, but I don't remember what book. Back on the Shadowhawk one, Rob Liefeld talked about this issue on his podcast several years ago. It was definitely inspired by Sin City. He used it as an opportunity to try out the technique Frank Miller was using on that book. On our Roadhouse movie review, we got movie was horrible. It's like they used the plot of One Crazy Summer, but with Muay Thai bar fights. Here's on the... Uh, Cable introduction for Marvel in the 90s. Great comic, artist. It's amazing and so hard to get a first print. Only a few in store. I was lucky. They had many prints. Good story. Liefeld was worth collecting. Yes, he was. On the best comics of the month, the monthly stream, someone had said, Duke is good. Hey, it's Flash by Night. Duke is good, but Cobra Commander is greater than Duke. I agree. R.I.P. Chappie. One vision on our Iron Eagle movie review. From a couple of years ago that, unfortunately, because of the loss of Lewis Gossip Jr., did get an uptick in its views. So we got a few comments like that. Here's one, uh, once again, from the Roadhouse movie review. The villain dialogue was trash, all of them. I think my nine-year-old could have written better dialogue between them. <laughs> Hell yeah. A Flash by Night also says on the Best Comics of the Month stream, Bueller's BSing is so good, I agree. On the Transformers top-down uh, uh, video that we did with Daniel Warren Johnson, when reading these Transformer books, it feels like I went through it in two minutes because it's so exciting. Hell yeah. On the Marvel in the 90s about Hulk 2099's first appearance, we got anything 2099 is either a hit or a major miss because the Hulk design is absolutely wild. <laughs> I agree. All right, now I want to drop down and highlight a comment that we got from... A creator this week. So if you want to talk about name dropping. Let's see. All right. We got a comment from Mike Allred. Right? I reviewed his latest book, Batman Dark Age. I'm a huge Mike Allred fan. And here's what he had to say. Thank you for the very encouraging words on Batman Dark Age. When making a comic, I always like to envision folks like you welcoming and appreciating the effort. If you dig number one, batty excited for everyone to see how it all pulls together. Top 10 all-time favorite project for me. Station Mike Allred, the Mike Allred, creator of Mad Men, co-creator of The Ecstatics with Pete Milligan. Watched our video, y'all. He's part of the army. That's awesome. So I responded, oh man, what an honor. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Love that the enthusiasm and craft has never wavered. Thanks for watching and commenting. It really made my day. And then Mike responded, thanks for singing the praises of comic books, especially when they're mine. Wink. Every voice is immeasurably important. How fucking cool is that, y'all? How fucking cool is that? All right, let's take a look at the chat here. The 
Billy says, there is a statue of Shiva outside of CERN headquarters. Yes, there is. 100%. Carrie says, interesting. The God of Destruction has a statue outside of CERN for real? Yeah, but Shiva is also representative of a protective force and a transformative force for the uh, universe, for the cosmos. So it's not quite so cut and dry as God of Destruction. So maybe the reasoning is, is a different reason than what most people might initially think. There's a little bit more nuance in that deity. But it would be interesting because I know it's there, but I don't know what the official reason that CERN says it's there for is. Sledhead says, raving in my kitchen currently. Carrie says, conspiracy theory. Robbie created the graphic with the kitty from a picture of my cat River looks so much like him. Well, maybe. <laughs> How did I get that picture of River? Canadian survivalist says the statue was donated from India. Billy says the image of CERN is hidden in the movies we watch. The image of CERN is hidden in the movies we watch? CERN logo has 666. Man, y'all really on the CERN shit. Okay. <laughs> when Doctor Strange is opening up portals, it looks like CERN. <laughs> okay. We've already talked about the Ed Piscor stuff. Billy says, the theory goes, the world was supposed to end in 2012. The colla they collapsed a parallel reality on top of ours to prevent it. A lot of people's natural destiny pattern ended, but they are still around. That's interesting. I don't think the world was supposed to end in 2012 because that was one of those doomsday prophecies, right? According to the Mayan calendar or whatever. And here's one thing I've learned in my life. If somebody says this is the end of the world, it's wrong. <laughs> but that is interesting. Canadian survivalist says C-3PO never had a silver leg in, in, in my reality. Looks so stupid. I don't remember him having the silver leg. And I remember when I first found out about that, I was like, wait, he's got a silver leg? What the fuck is up with that? And I do, honestly, I remember being a kid and hearing that Nelson Mandela had died in prison. And then there's the Berenstein Bears shit, right? So there's all of that. Who knows? When The more you learn about like quantum mechanics and quantum reality, the more crazy it gets. Jay Sloan Art says, never got into Savage Dragon, the only original image title I didn't buy. Oh, you should totally check it out. It's good stuff. There's these two hardcovers now that can, you know, if you don't want to go digging through dollar bins. Gary says, for your information, if anyone likes wine, the House of Dragon Pinot Noir is actually not bad. Okay. Need all Reddit heroes? That would be great. Fable says, see, that positivity pays off. Sure does, doesn't it? Name drop every one drink. Hey, there's Dylan, my brother from another mother. What is up, Dylan? Happy Easter to you, my man. Sledhead's got a man crush on Mike already. Yeah, it's a pretty cool dude. Good looking, too. Billy, speaking on Roadhouse, says, Conor McGregor was a lot of fun to watch. Acting, not that great, but he was fun to watch. And he acted like he was having the time of his life and wanted to be there. I agree with that 100%. American Demon says, Steins Gate, top tier anime. Never, I know of it, but I've never seen it. Let me write that down. CERN Conspiracy War. Okay. Brother Joe. Robbie, if you had rabbit ears, you would look like the Energizer Bunny. Happy Easter. You know it, my man. <laughs> harp is used against you. What does that mean? Same with harp. What is harp? Am I stupid? Am I supposed to know what this is? Harp Research Facility? Alaska? Is that what we're talking about? Harp.
high frequency active auroral research center? Is that what we're talking about? We live in a simulation, says Elon Musk. Simulation theory is a real thing. Like the idea that we could just actually be a holographic uh, projection of information on the side of the universe and that the interior of the universe is actually empty or something shaped like a donut or some shit like that. CERN is a curious topic. I've, I've never dived too much into it because I'm a big science head. So like, I, I really like, you know, I've always been like, yay, CERN, particles, rock, <laughs> quarks, <laughs> you know, but uh, I've never really dived super heavy into it. So I definitely think I need to for the next Team Dog Shades night. <clears throat> and we got a super chat, Brad W. Happy Easter, brother. Been digging the videos. Well, thank you so much. And YouTube is telling me that's your very first super chat on a live stream and a very, very gracious one. You've crushed all the goals for tonight. We had some goals set up. First one was going to be Marvel in the 90s. Next was going to be an unboxing. Next was going to be a second top-down reveal. We hit all the goals because of Brad. Y'all, throw Brad a station. Throw him a pop-pop boom. He's really done the Lord's work tonight on this Easter Sunday Teen Dog Shades night. Thank you so much, bro. We really appreciate it. Station. Let's do this. Let me tell you about this little man I know. His name is Hellboy. He was sent to the earth some long time ago to save it or destroy. Brought to this earth by Rasputin, son of a demon and a nun who had a sex with a demon. But was raised by Professor Broom And now he fights evil and monsters Shit! Now he fights with a man who's a fish named Abe Now he fights with a fire starter Named Liz Brad, we really do appreciate the super chat. It really does help us out here on the channel and it helps keep the lights on, the blue lights and the teen dog shades on. So thank you so much for your gracious contribution. In fact, biggest super chat of the month. Here we are at the end of the month. So definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Carrie says, quantum physics is so much fun to look at because I used to be so into ghost hunting and paranormal, I look at it so much. Yeah, absolutely. Easy Dick from Nine Panel Grid says, within the grand calculus of the multiverse, if probably still be hanging with all y'all watching Rock and Robbie Live. What? What? I mean, I know it's a Teen Dog Shades night, Eric, but I'm confused as fuck by that one, brother. Maybe that meant something else in the previous crushed reality in 2012 before CERN fucked it all up. <laughs> hey, what's up, Mary? Good to see ya. I need to watch that Shelley Duvall movie y'all sent me. Charlie says, can't believe you vape, dude. It destroys your comics. Don't worry, the way I handle my comics destroys them first. Harp or ARP? I say the old folks know a lot more than they're letting on. <laughs> Charlie's in the house says, I wish uh, the Twilight Zone were real. DARPA and the Gates look into it. 
Harp, the high frequency active auroral research program. What does that have to fucking do with anything, Jay? What's going on with that? I don't know, Billy. Is it fucking real? Are we in a crashed fucking collapsed universe? What do you think of the hard problem of consciousness? What do you mean hard problem of consciousness? Is that like a term to mean something? The hard problem of consciousness. Do you mean like, what do I think consciousness is? I don't fucking know. Oh, here we go. The hard problem of consciousness is the problem of explaining why any physical state is conscious rather than non-conscious. It is the problem of explaining why there is something it is like for a subject in conscious experience, why conscious mental states light up and directly appear to the subject. What? <laughs> huh? In philosophy of the mind, the hard problem of consciousness is to explain why and how humans and other organisms have qualia, phenomenal consciousness, or subjective experiences. I have no fucking idea. The crazier thing is this. Space and time are one thing, and all exists. Past, present, future, all equally real, all present and happening right now. According to the math, according to the laws of physics that we're aware of right now. Past, present, future, all equally real. Boom. Static, actually. Looking from above, peeling yourself above this universe, looking at it. It's all one. It all is. It all exists. In like a static state. With a lot of things going on, right? Therefore, why do we have a stream of consciousness that goes boom, 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 boom? Why do we have an arrow of time? It, it's like entropy causes the idea of the arrow of time, but it's actually a false idea. Time is actually an illusion. It's, it's, but because time and space are intertwined and movement through space affects the passage of time. But if you peel outside of it, just imagine this fist is all of time and space from the, let's say the arm, the big bang all the way to the end of the universe is here. Let's say we're right here. Let's be, let's be very gracious and say that we still got a long way to go till the end of the universe. Okay. All right. Let's say we're here right now. This end of the universe is still real. It's still happening, right? And the beginning of the universe is still happening. It's all real. And if you peeled yourself away from it, was able to look at it like this, you'd see it all, right? So why do we have conscious thought that seems to go from moment to moment to moment to moment to moment? Why do we have what we call a present? And why is consciousness a part of that? It's fucking wild. I don't know. Carrie says, got to go take a moment to clear my browser history due to looking up stuff like CERN, HARP, and Shiva. <laughs> Nine Panel Grit says, spell check is a motherfucker. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's what you're saying, Mary. I, I, I'm I, excited to check it out. Happy Easter to you. Look it up. Very fascinating. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch some videos about that. We are going to get to see the birth of a star. I cannot wait. I would love to see something like that. Or a supernova, actually. We actually got to see one that was in the sky that, like, was super fucking bright. That would be a trip. It's all now. Exactly, Warren. It's all now. Time could be considered the fourth dimension, yeah. It's basically saying, how do you explain consciousness if we are all just chemicals? Where does subjective experience come from? Exactly. And how is that tied into... The flow of time. These are the things I think about. It's the burrito theory, like in the movie Peggy Sue Got Married. Because we're only three-dimensional beings. No, we're not. We're, in, we're four because we, we're also beings locked by not just the three dimensions of space, but the dimension of time. We are also locked in it. So it's because we're four-dimensional beings and not fifth or sixth or seventh dimensional beings, probably, right? But then what does that mean to have your consciousness be across all of it? How weird is that? Do you get to pick, like, where you are in the timeline? Ah. <sighs> We're all smoking too much weed. The <laughs> sled head. <laughs> oh, man.
This month it happens. What, the, uh, the birth of a new star? How do we know that? How do we know we'd be seeing the birth of a new star? No, Jay, we are traveling in time. We're traveling in time right now. We're now actually, all of us are traveling in space and time. So, think about this. Movement through space affects the passage of time, right? So we think we're standing still, but we're not because we're on an earth that's spinning, that's rotating, or that's revolving around the sun. The sun is part of the galactic, is part of the galaxy that's orbiting the, the galactic core. The galaxies are all together in a super cluster that are orbiting and moving. Everything is fucking moving. So if you remove all movement in the universe, time ceases to be and all space is a fine point. We're static. Are we back at the Big Bang? Is do y'all see what I'm saying? Like, I understand. Like, the faster you move through space, the slower time moves for you. Okay, but think about this. Think about the rate and the speed that everything in the universe is fucking moving at, including us. Around, like the Earth spinning, going around the sun, sun going around the galactic core, the galaxies doing their fucking thing, the superclusters doing their fucking thing. Think about that movement. How is that slowing time? Are we only experiencing time because of the motion through space? Motion through space diverts movement through time. Movement through time diverts movement through space? Just thinking about it. Well, one can travel in one direction. We can't travel backwards. Allegedly... Unless we got an Einstein-Rosen bridge, that's a possibility. And here's the thing. If you went back in time, you can't change anything because it all is. The past, present, future. If you went back in time and killed your grandfather, then in reality, that wasn't your grandfather. Unless your grandfather had already conceived your father or mother. You know, the grandfather paradox, that's how that works. Like, honestly, like if you went back in time, found your grandfather before he ever met his wife, so you were going to kill him to destroy your family line, whoa, well, this is a paradox. No, it's actually not your grandfather. Like, and there would be some, like, it's like it already, it already fucking happened. That's why a lot of these time travel movies are complete bullshit. Back to the Future has fucked a lot of people's ideas of time completely out of whack with what the scientific consensus is. But that being said, what the scientific consensus is now is the misinformation of the future, right? Because every time we think we got something figured out, we're just going to learn more. We don't know shit about how time and space work. We don't know shit about the history of this universe. We don't know shit about anything. We have ideas. They will all eventually prove to be wrong. Think of your existence as a gun ball. Everything you can comprehend is inside of it, including the endless universe. Right next to your gun ball is another gun ball. Gun ball. You say, okay, spell check. Gun ball. I was like, what the fuck is a gun ball, Billy? <laughs> I was like, is that the fucking bullets they used in the Revolutionary War? <laughs> Charlie says, people are not really conscious. They are controlled via their subconscious. Time doesn't really exist. It was made to control us with the Gre when the Gregorian calendar came into effect. Fair enough. Inside a gumball machine. I get you. We're all gumballs in a gumball machine. We're all marbles in the fucking Orion's belt. <laughs> Mary says, it is so fascinating. My son is currently obsessed with space-time and general relativity. Alfredo and I are trying to learn enough about it all to keep up with him. He might actually be an alien. Huh. You need to watch or read. Um, there are There's two books by Brian Greene that I would recommend. Um, but there's also two PBS, like, Nova specials that if you don't want to read the books, you can just watch these specials. You can find them on YouTube. Um, I have a DVD copy of both of them in one thing. It's called like Space and Time, blah, blah, blah. I can send you a picture of it or a link. But uh, the first one is called The Elegant Universe. And that, that book became a three-part series on PBS. And then there's a book called Fabric of the Cosmos. And 
those that that became a four episode miniseries on PBS. I would highly recommend those to anybody watching. 100%. The books and the the documentary specials. Sticky Ricky says, "You mean time should always be now and we should have no memory and thoughts of the future?" I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. Is like if all movement stopped, what happens to time? Movement through time slows time. So if it all stopped, time's constant? Time is? I don't know. But what we think of as now is not true. Right? Like I I know this is beyond what most people experience, right? But we're thinking of we're talking about concepts that are way outside of our experience, right? So it's all just theoretical. It's all speculation, really. But like what the fuck does that mean? Like if the faster you move through space, the slower time moves. That's time dilation. That shit's apparently proven true, right? Way back in the day. When we weren't even fucking born yet, when this shit was fucking proven, right? Just by thought, by the way. And let's talk about thought. What the fuck is thought, right? Like, it's just, it's, it's just fucking mind boggling. April 8th. April 8th is the solar eclipse. Bobby says, I travel back in time every week with Marvel in the 90s. Hell yeah. Warren says, but Doctor Who, Doctor Who's bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> The CIA have been looking into time travel. The show Fringe was likely written by them to reflect their experiments. It touches on the multiverse too. Why the fuck would the CIA write a sci-fi show? What would be the purpose of that? Get people interested so they can recruit nerds who go into this stuff? Swearing not good? Not the place for you then, sorry. Think about this. Nature does not use a clock, yet they did much better till the human race fucked it up where certain... Well, Charlie, I get what you're saying, but it does kind of use a clock because one of the first clocks we ever had is the passage of seasons and the predictability of the moon and the sun and the seasonal change and the tides and all that shit. That's kind of like the first clock. I think nature does have a clock, but the reason I... The, the big thing that's mind-boggling to me is if all time and space exist now and it's all equally real... Why do we feel like we are in a moment of time, a slice that keeps perpetually going forward? That's the thing. The universe is like one big blender. It is. Brother Joe says, we know once Robbie opens the portal, we enter the twilight zone. Warren says, what we need is some sort of physician for this problem, someone with the knowledge of time and its relative dimensions in space. Hell yeah. Elon implemented a brain chip. <laughs> hey, what's up, Lev? How you doing? Thank you. One collection down says, Quantum Leap was on to something, sending consciousness back in time, not to your physical body. I mean... Right? And I've seen somebody else mention Quantum Leap. When you remember strange things, you see yourself, you're traveling back into time. Possibly. And maybe, are there people that can control that? And what happens when we die? Does our consciousness just fucking spark back over to the beginning and run through? Is there something outside? Do, do we have a spirit that peels off of this? Are we collectively something, an organism? Is our universe and all of us part of it just a collective organism, one thing in the men and Are we one gumball next to other gumballs? As above, so below. Each human a universe, each universe a human. What do you think? Jay Sloan says, PBS Space Time is a good start for beginners. Absolutely. Watch that, then read the book if you want to go deeper into it. And then just follow the rabbit hole. (laughs) 
Charlie says, Robbie, in Australia, my local comic shop, which is like a million miles away, have decided to no longer import comics. So do you sell to Australia? I mean, we probably would, but you'll be going, your shipping costs would be fucking ridiculous, I'm sure. I have to, you'd have to look into that, but I cannot imagine that being cheap at all. Sticky Ricky says, I am as addicted to nihilism videos. It really messed me up, and I am now in therapy for cult deprogramming. Well, good for you. Good luck. Ronald says, Erie, Indiana was my jam. Yo, it was. I loved Erie, Indiana. Mary says, just wrote both of those down. We'll definitely check them out. I think that those, and I think they're on YouTube. I think you can find them on YouTube. Charlie says, anyone seen the Twilight Zone episode called A Little Peace and Quiet? A woman funds a charm pendant, whatever, and can make time stop? I don't remember that one, no. But I haven't seen every episode. Yeah, only Cotton Eye Joe knows. <laughs> Mike says, our brains are a big piece of the puzzle, in my honest opinion. We are deeply connected to everything, including time. I can dig on that. Cardstock Variant says, how do we get so lucky to have sufficient land and also water and an atmosphere to foster life and a moon just the right size and distance to create tides and eclipses? Just the right distance now. Hasn't always been, won't always be, but I know. It seems too perfect. And why now? I don't know. I want to know. One thing I do wish, and God damn it, if we die and we just die and we don't get to fucking know, that would be a fucking bummer. <laughs> but I guess we wouldn't fucking be able to lament it. Looks like X-Men 97 episodes are having people buy back issues. That's super cool. That means Mark Silvestri shit's about to be expensive. Bobby says, perhaps all those mysteries and more will be revealed when we hit the other side, my friend. I fucking hope so. If not, what a fucking bummer. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Robbie, you might be talking about the concept of astral travel. The astral is a completely different plane. The astral is kind of like the scaffolding of the universe in a way. It's a whole different thing. But I get what you're saying. Our Ariaga confidently says our consciousness reintegrates to the energy of the universe. Very confident. <laughs> Canadian survivalist says if the radio doesn't have a person in it, if it receives in it, it receives a signal. If you break the radio, it won't work, but there is still a signal. Also, oh, like we're like radios and the consciousness is our signal from the universe. Are we the universe trying to understand itself? But if we don't get to know, I guess we really do get to know. Then I guess I guess so. It's fucking random. <laughs> All right. Not a lot of DC books this week for me, but here is your official DC sneak peek. All right. Now, I will tell you this. Somehow, my dumbass left my copy of Batman at work, so I didn't get to read the new issue of Batman. But there is a new issue of Batman this week. But what I did read was Poison Ivy, issue number 21. This is the final part of the secret origin of Pamela Isley. Here we move into the actual moments where she becomes Poison Ivy. Her first, uh, let's call them adventures, into being Poison Ivy. Um, the entire three-issue arc has been a little, it's been a little uneven. Like, I liked the beginning. I really liked the middle. And the end is decent, too. But it seemed like all the important stuff was really done in one and two. And it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot being done in issue number three, except for just kind of catching us up to date. But I do like Poison Ivy. And I cannot believe that this book's been going on for 21 issues. Hasn't stopped. Hasn't been rebooted. Has maintained a very solid readership and following, at least at my shop. And has continued maintaining consistent sales. Of course, that is helped by a lot of cheesecakey uh, covers that go along with it. But you know what? Whatever it takes, this is great. This is what we want in comics. We want characters to be explored and we want runs to keep going. Now, I know that I'm talking about a book that's only 21 issues deep, 
But in modern comics, that's that's actually kind of a big deal. So I liked it. I thought it was decent. Then we got Superman 78, the Metal Curtain, issue number six, the final issue of this reality's version of Superman 4. Like, why? if the Mandela effect's real and CERN's fucking up reality, why could we not have gone to a reality where there wasn't a Superman fucking 3 and 4? Or where they were better? Anyway, so this is uh, Superman versus the Soviets. Um, very appropriate for a movie that, you know, could have take, take place in the 80s. Uh, taking place in the 80s, Metallo, a Russian agent, fighting Superman. This is a big cheesy finale that goes by maybe a little bit too quick, but it's actually cheesy enough that I think cinematically it would work. But in comics, it just kind of breezes right by. Then we've got Shazam here with issue number 10. Um, we got Josie Campbell on the writing here. Mark Wade has exited this book. This is the first part of Moving Day, which is Shazam and his family, Billy and his family, moving into a new home or a new redesigned home by Zeus. And Zeus, of course, added some extra features to their house, including interdimensional doors that are causing chaos. The book's got a goofy... Silver Age, Golden Age, kind of Shazammy, Captain Marvel vibe to it. And I do appreciate that. The art, though, has taken a big step down. It's a Manuela Lupacino. Art's fine, but you're coming off of Dan Mora, so it's a little bit of a step down, but it was still enjoyable. But the best DC book I read this week was Neil Before Zod, issue number four. Joe Casey, friend of the show, we had him on a few weeks ago. Check out that conversation. But Neil Before Zod is ridiculously awesome and badass. A lot of people thought that this book was setting up the death of Zod so that his wife can be the new Zod and go all woke and all that shit. That is not what is happening in this book. In fact... Zod has recently got some new motivation, and after the shocking results of the last issue, Zod is on a mission of vengeance. What a great cover, by the way. That is Zod just blowing a hole through somebody. Joe Casey, when he was here, said he wanted to bring Zod back to the villainous roots that he remembered being associated with Zod, and he is fucking doing it. This is fucking badass. And there's a variant cover from my homie, Mark Spears. I've known Mark Spears for over 20 years. We used to work together at a comic shop. He's been a homie for a long time and he did those spawn covers. He's got a lot more exciting things coming up, including this Zod cover. Cannot wait to see Mark again because I'll see him at the expo and I'm going to get him to sign his name in that little moon area right there. But hell yeah. Congrats to Mark. There's more DC covers, there's Power Ranger covers, and more things unannounced coming on the horizon. Now, here's the other thing I want to point out. This is Sandman Remastered. This is the issue 19, yeah, 19 of Sandman, which was the one that, well, I think it won the, the World Fantasy something like the Hugo Award or some shit. It won some award um, back in the day. This is the issue where Dream commissions um, Shakespeare basically to write Midsummer's Night as a play for the Fae, right? And so this is recolored by Steve Olaf, who did the original color guides, but apparently was dissatisfied with some of the coloring. Now, what's his name? Is it Jose Villarubia? He was recently talking. I did not know this. The collections of Sandman are recolored, at least the early ones, right? And he was showing a comparison to some of the early issues and Man, I've never wanted to go through and find every single issue of Sandman, but now I'm kind of tempted to because I didn't even know that they had recolored. But this is gorgeous. So it's a remastering of the colors by Steve Olaf. And in the back, as a special bonus, you get reprinted some of his original color guides. Steve Olaf, one of the best colorists in the biz. So to recap... Poison Ivy, kind of shaky ending to the secret origin of Pamela Isley, but I still enjoyed it. Superman 78, The Metal Curtain, a very brief and kind of cheesy ending, but it actually does work for that version of Superman. Shazam, a little bit of a step down in art and story, but still kind of fun. But then, Neil Before Zod. Y'all need to read Neil Before Zod. Check out the Mark Spears cover. Check out the regular cover. Buy two copies. That's a 12-issue series that sets up a lot of shit for superman in 2025 and then sandman remastered issue 19 one of the best single issues of sandman recolored remastered by the master himself steve olaf that's been your dc sneak peek all right y'all 
The Zod run is everything I want out of a villain-led book. More runs like this of unexplored villains. Pump for the House of Brainiac 2. Absolutely. Dude, Zod is so good. Wait till you read this one. It's so fucking amazing. Hey, what's up, Chris from Lost in Comics? How you doing? I appreciate a long run. Stuff doesn't need to relaunch constantly. Just advertise a new story as new reader friendly. Exactly. More anti-Soviet propaganda or a piece of fiction set in the 80s and portraying how it would have been in the 80s. I'm talking about the, we're talking about the era of Rocky IV, Red Dawn, shit like that. So I think that's what they're going for there. <clears throat> when you die, you just see Andros from Star Fox 64 laughing at you for eternity. <laughs> Check this out. Consciousness exists in another dimension and life is a radio for it. Oh, yeah. That's a fucking thought. Like, 100%. Ley lines, y'all. I just, I might just be mentioning weird things to influence conversation, or am I? <laughs> Anything mentioned on a live chat influences people. That's how people are easy to control. Yeah, no shit. Mark, cheers for 20 years. Let's drink some beers. And we got a super chat from Choco's 26. Thank you so much for the $5 super chat. We love you. This one's for you. Let me tell you about this little man I know His name is Hellboy He was sent to the earth some long time ago To save it or destroy Brought to this earth by Rasputin Son of a demon and a nun who Had a sex with the demon But was raised by Professor Broom and now he fights evil and monsters. Shit! Now he fights with a man who's a fish named Aves Fish. And now he fights with a fire starter named Liz. And the an exoplan named Yokai. BPRD. y'all i appreciate the super chats appreciate the support it really really does help us out keeps the blue lights on keeps the videos rolling and so now it's time to go back how far back in time to our favorite decade to talk about comics y'all it's time for your next sneak peek at an upcoming top down bottoms up video on a little segment on rock and robbie live we like to call marvel in the 90s. Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're talking about the best-selling American comic of all time, X-Men number one. Do-do-do-do-do-do. Do-do-do-do-do-do. Do-do-do-do-do. Do-do-do-do. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're going to be flipping through X-Men number one. This is the most selling comic, American comic, of all time. Over 8 million copies of X-Men number one were printed. They were all over the place. This was a very, very big deal, and it's been a long time coming for us to go through this here on the channel. Now, I was going to do this one time on a Rockin' Robbie Live from Marvel in the 90s, but here we are, 
top down, bottoms up, to talk about X-Men number one, right? Now, it came with a bunch of different covers. This is the cover that I've had since I was a kid. I was a huge Wolverine fan. I love this brown costume, so of course I have that. I don't have the other covers, but I do have the Gatefold Edition, which does combine the covers into one image, which is really, really nice to have. It also contains all of the little special pinups that were in each issue. So each issue of this had a special pinup and they are all collected here. There's also this awesome like poster that you can have in the middle there. Now this re this this gatefold edition is printed on glossy paper, which actually makes the colors to me a little bit more gaudy. I'll show you what I'm talking about. But the way that the newsprint kind of allows these colors to soak in versus this glossier thing, like, I really prefer the newsprint edition. Like, I know that a lot of people, especially on screen, it looks like these colors pop, but there's just, there's something off about them. They set into the paper more. We can go on and on about this stuff, but it is definitely something I'm passionate about, is comic book coloring. And I do think that there are things that happen with the coloring that works so much better on the newsprint versus this glossy edition. So even though I did get this, the version, I wanted this when I was a kid so much, I didn't get this until way later, um, but this is the version that I had as a kid, the exact copy I had as a kid, 1991, August. I remember this very vividly. Spider-Man number one had already come out by Todd McFarlane. X-Force number one had already come out by Rob Liefeld. And now we had X-Men number one by Jim Lee and Chris Claremont, but this was the signifier of the end of the initial 16-year Chris Claremont era on X-Men. And this is definitely what led to what most people think of as the X-Men that are in my generation, because the X-Men, when they started in the 60s, they weren't very popular. They didn't get popular really till the 70s when they did giant size X-Men number one. They introduced Wolverine and Storm and Colossus and Nightcrawler and other characters. Chris Claremont came in, did a really long extended run with people like Dave Cockrum and John Byrne and Paul Smith and, 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 and Mark Silvestri and John Romita Jr. My very first X-Men comic I ever read was like X-Men 199 or something has like Rachel Summers Phoenix on the cover, John Romita Jr. artwork. And I, I didn't really stay into X-Men in the earliest days of me reading. In fact, I didn't really fully get into X-Men until this issue right here. It was a new number one. It was Jim Lee. It was all over the place. When this book came out, I'm 10 years old. The perfect age for something like this. Now, what had happened at this time was that Jim Lee was the rising star, right? For like the last two years over at Marvel, his work on Punisher and Uncanny X-Men, he was just becoming one of the absolute rock stars of this industry. And he had a direction he wanted to take the X-Men. Claremont had some wild ideas about where to continue his story that he's been developing for 16 years. Ultimately, Jim Lee won out. It was the art that was really selling the books back in these days, and the way, which ultimately led to the formulation of Image Comics, right? But this, a watershed milestone moment for comics. This is the highest selling American comic of all time. Let's find out why. What about this book makes it work? Let's crack open the book. Let's get into it. All right, first thing I want to point out is this Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure video game. Um, it absolutely sucks. This game is terrible. I've never played the Game Boy one. That actually might be different because it looks more like a platformer. Maybe I'd check that one out. But this original NES game, y'all, it sucks. Don't take my word for it. Angry Video Game Nerd did a video about it. Definitely check it out. And it this game sucks. I remember being a kid and renting it a couple times and just being clueless. Most of the time when I was a kid, and I would rent NES games, I was clueless as to what I was supposed to do. And so I would just like play them for the weekend and we'd take them back. I'd never go back to them. But after watching that AVGN episode, I did get uh, a copy of it uh, on a, an, an emulator and, and tried to play through it. And it is, it is dog shit. It is terrible. All right, so we're going to kick open this story with some very typical Jim Lee, Scott Williams isms. Okay. Um, so what we have here is we got a, some mutant terrorists 
who have stolen a shuttle from the U.S. government. They are being pursued. They are going after them. And then there's a big flash of light. And then what a great double page spread here of Magneto showing up. There's Asteroid M. Just magnificent. The power, the scale, the scope. Maybe the Earth could have loomed larger here to give us more of a sense of the perspective on it. That seems kind of small, but I love this. I absolutely love this image. I remember vividly in my head, Magneto without his helmet, all these dudes' faces, the way that Jim Lee and Scott Williams would do their hatching was so, is so awesome at the time. It was monumental to me. I loved Jim Lee's artwork. I still do. I used to always say that Jim Lee was my favorite original image founder. He was like my favorite artist out of those original guys. And my opinions kind of shift and change as the years progress, but still Jim Lee is one of the best and I've always been a fan of his. So Magneto shows up. He's like, yo, this is my home. I'm staying here. Why are y'all on my doorstep causing all this commotion? The rest of the team, by the way, Joe Rosas on the coloring, Tom Orzakowski on the lettering, one of the best letterers in the business, especially at this time. Um, this is pre-digital lettering. So all this stuff is hand done and it's, it's just flawless. And Claremont's a very verbose writer. Um, he uses a lot of purple prose. And the way that Tom Orzakowski is able to get it all in there is actually a truly magnificent piece of work, right? All right, then you get this great uplit shot of Magneto close up. This is something that comics didn't do before the image founders kind of really came on the scene. Before the Todd McFarlane's, before Jim Lee, before Rob Liefeld, a lot of comic art was very static on the page and a lot of that was because of direction from DC editors from Marvel editors from Jim Shooter in particular lots of lots of medium shots lots of like little mid shots very rarely would you see a breaking up of the panel composition very rarely would you see an open panel like this where it's just a big splash with little panels over it but it works and it's dynamic and there's so many I think one of the reasons why this is one of the best selling comics of all time is because Jim Lee's artwork was popping like nobody else was. We talk about Liefeld, we talk about McFarlane, their sense of energy, their sense of dynamism that they're bringing to the page, but shots like this, N Liefeld and McFarlane couldn't touch this. They could not come close to this when I was a kid. In fact, when I was a kid, everybody would love McFarlane and Liefeld, and I'm on I'm on Jim Lee's ass. You know what I'm saying? I'm like I'm on him, and I'm like, nah, that those dudes don't know what they're doing compared to this guy. Um, the the wide hatching that a lot of people I get the the criticism of it as far as classic comic book inking, but this was a new style that was coming, and it was rather it was a good move on Marvel to to tie their hitch, I guess, if that's the right analogy, uh, to the Jim Lee wagon because it's just absolutely amazing. So Magneto shows up. These people are mutants who are trying to... They stole this shuttle to get to Asteroid M to have Magneto be their new leader, right? And Magneto's like not been a villain for a while, right? There's... There's this whole period of X-Men history that they're referencing right now in X-Men 97 when Magneto had the, the purple costume that we see right here. Um, he was the leader of the X-Men for a while. Xavier had been a while uh, gone for a while. The original uh, five members of the X-Men were in their own book, X-Factor, which I was a fan of when I was a kid for some reason. I did like X-Factor, but it cause, it's because it had Beast and Iceman, and I really liked Beast and Iceman. There's some Liefeld right there. Look at, look at them thunder thighs. Um... Magneto had been a good guy, and Marvel and Jim Lee wanted Magneto to kind of get back to being the bad guy. And right before this, they were trying to develop an animated series. Um, we know that as Pride of the X-Men. It is what the X-Men arcade machine was kind of based on that team. Um, but this is, this is going to be the blueprint for what will become X-Men, the animated series, in magnificent fashion. So we're getting a lot of backstory here. Magneto used to be a good guy. Are we sure that it's him? Nick Fury's there talking to the president. At the time, this would have been George Bush Sr. Uh, not gonna do it. Not gonna do it. Dana Carvey. Man, I love the 90s. So anyway, um, so he's talking and they're like, you know, the Soviets are acting up. 
Europeans are acting up, the U.S. government, they're, everybody's getting itchy tr trigger fingers because Magneto seems to be back and he has taken hostage some of these space people, right? Or space people, some of these astronauts or whatever, right? But Nick Fury has an alternative. That alternative is going to be the X-Men. So then we get, we get a cut to the X-Men during a training session. Iconic poses here. Big splash, big iconic figures, solid coloring throughout this issue. I, I do like the coloring. It, it, it works better to me, like I said at the beginning of the video, on that page as opposed to this. Like, just see the difference. Like, and I, I get it. A lot of people like these bright, crisp kind of things. But what I will point your attention to is, for instance, things like the, these computer panels, right? You see the magenta little lights? They work so much better here for me. Like, the way that they kind of soak in. And, you know, I'm not saying... Now, I will say this. The line work comes across very more, much more crisp here on this, right? Excuse me, but it's the coloring that doesn't quite sell it for me. So I prefer the newsprint, but these are iconic shots that I've heard other YouTubers mention that they would draw these over and over. So would I. Like so many people were learning comic book art and figure drawing and anatomy from this kind of stuff. We had debuts of the new uh, Cyclops costume, the new uh, Rogue costume. I was a huge Archangel fan. It's probably one of the reasons why I loved X-Factor so much in the 80s when I was a small kid, because the look of, of Archangel and Apocalypse really sells me over. So they're doing a little training mission. They're supposed to find Jean Grey and the Professor, while they're being monitored, there's Banshee, Forge, Beast, Storm, Cyclops. And they're going to try to find Professor Xavier and Jean Grey, debut of the new Jean Grey costume. It's also the debut of this new Storm costume. I believe this is the first time we see this costume. And it's the return of the original team. It's also the return of Professor Xavier. He had not been there. This is kind of like a back-to-basics approach and reboot, relaunch, of the X-Men. A lot of stuff had been happening. We're coming off the Australian Outback years um, where we had Dazzler, we had Longshot, and the team was... So it's like a return to like the basics and an and emerging of the original concept with the ideas of like Magneto being the bad guy and Cyclops being the leader and but with the new school, with the stuff from the 70s and the 80s all merged together and it does it excellently well. A lot of a lot of just reminiscing about previous stuff right here. All right, so Rogues and Iceman. Iceman immediately gets hit by these uh, weapons around the perimeter of the mansion. He gets taken out, but what a great shot. Once again, another iconic shot of Rogue and the debut of her new costume. Jim Lee loves leather jackets on, on superheroes, in particular women superheroes. And you know what? We're all here for it. So she takes the heat-seeking miss missiles to uh, to fool them basically so they take out some of the defenses which leads the way for archangel to unleash colossus this might be one of my favorite drawings in this entire issue i drew this so many times like i traced it or i would draw it from from just looking at it it's one of the things i used to do back in the day colossus comes through but immediately gets hit by a, a telepathic attack from gene gray then we cut to underneath while team a went above Team B is going below. Wolverine, Gambit, and Psylocke. I had no clue who Psylocke was in these days. Like, Psylocke had done a, a complete change. This is when she was had taken over the body of an Asian woman. This is the Psylocke most people my age remember and absolutely love. Gambit was very, very new. And I was unfamiliar with who this character was. I do remember thinking his costume was stupid. And in these days, I was not a Gambit fan but I have come around just a little bit. What an excellent Wolverine, though. We only get this Wolverine in the series three issues of this brown and tan costume. Then he goes back to the original, uh, or a version of the original yellow and blue. And that's fine, because it kind of works with the, with the colors of some of the rest of the team. One of the things that always did interest me was that the X-Men had very, like, personalized costumes. They didn't all have like a look or a uniform. I actually like it when X-Men comics go into that, but great use of screen tone here, a gradient screen tone. Scott Williams is a solid inker, but he's a 
fantastic, spectacular inker on Jim Lee. It works so well. But there's some more of those big, thick lines. Some early looks at some of the, the molding trying to be done with the coloring there is a little weird. How does that look on the glossy paper? We may do this every so often here. All right, so you can, for instance, you can, yeah, the color, yeah, it actually stands out way more on here. Seems weird. One thing is, I, you know, the line clarity is, is better here. But, like, look at this last panel. This one seems more menacing and more like, I don't know, this just feels, it's just too gaudy. It's too bold. It's just, it's not there. And even though the lines come across better, the screen tone is almost too obvious on this one. Here, it really blends in, soaks in a little bit more, making this like a murky kind of thing where it goes from dark to light. But here, it's just maybe a little bit too clean and a little bit too obvious. So anyway, Wolverine and them are coming up. They're getting attacked by these these machines. A great ass shot of Psylocke right there. You get a, you get a, you get T and A right there. But it's probably one of the reasons why 10, 11, and 12 year old Robbie absolutely love Psylocke. But they're going to town on these things. Wolverine's hamming it up, saying that Gambit has ran off on his own. It's supposed to be about teamwork. So Gambit shows up. He finds Jean Grey, hits her with the cards. And one thing that Chris Claremont, you know, he's old school. So he's part of that whole era of, you know, every comic could be somebody's first, especially when it's X-Men number one, a mutant milestone, right? So every comic book can be somebody's first. And he explains everything. So even though I didn't know who Gambit was, I know his personality. I know his character. I know his power set. I know all of this already from this first issue. But he throws his his kinetically charged uh, cards, and he goes and gives a kiss to Jean Grey, which is claiming his prize. But she blows up because her and the professor are just robots. That's right. It's just robots. Here's an interesting thing. Nothing more 90s than this. This is an ad for being able to call a 900 number and play along with an X-Men game, and then you would have, like, <laughs> like your parents would get, like, an insane, insane phone bill. That's an Eric Larson image right there, too. So I remember this. I called this one time, and I got in trouble like a mofo. 100%. All right. So Cyclops is proud of himself. He's having a little bit of banter with Gene. Uh, Professor Xavier's not used to this Cyclops, right? He's learned a little bit of a sense of deadpan humor, as B says here. And in the midst of all of this banter, Wolverine pops up. I love the detail of still having one of the, the robotic uh, minions that they were fighting off him and Psylocke on him. The battle ravaged suit. This seems to only happen to Wolverine. His costume just gets shredded, but it just shows you, right? Comes in here. Boom. Tag. Bang, Charlie. You're dead. Back off, Wolverine, you made your point. Are you nuts or what? You know how dangerous those adamantium claws are you, of yours are. A wave of your arm can slice through solid still. One slip just now. I don't slip, bub. Exercise was to tag the puff. That's just what I did. You got a problem with that? This is that, di that classic Wolverine Cyclops dynamic. I love that dynamic to their personalities their relationship. Um, and then we cut to the danger room. It's a new version of the danger room. This is what I'm familiar with. Oh, it's all been in a holographic kind of thing. Um, Wolverine, like, you know, I'm going to go off. I got better things to do than sit here and keep trying, right? Because Professor Xavier is back. The world's getting larger. The world's getting more deadly. Things are getting more threatening. We need a new X-Men team. Cyclops proposes to, to split the team into two strike files or to strike teams, right? We got the blue team, we got the gold team. X-Men becomes the blue team. The uncanny X-Men is the gold team. The blue team, that's the heart of 90s X-Men. Everybody's loving this stuff. Um, but then they get briefed by Nick Fury about the Magneto situation. They're all discussing what they should do. This is interesting stuff here. It's, it's you know, what Jim Lee's really good at are the big moments like this, the claws coming out. Like, the little moments of just talking heads, he does it fine. It's decent. He keeps it interesting enough. Um, you got some decent coloring work there. You got a little bit more screen tone usage. Um, here is the uh, the pinup by Scott, uh, Scott Williams and Jim Lee. In this version, each cover, I have the Wolverine, Cyclops, Iceman cover, but each one has its own uh, pinup in there, and they reproduce all of the pinups in the gatefold edition. 
So like there's the one that's a villains gallery by Jim Lee. And then there was that one with the original X-Men by Jim Lee. That one, which is very famous because there was a poster of this that my buddy used to have on his wall and I wanted this poster so much. In fact, I would love a poster of this, but it's, you know why I was digging this as a kid. There's a lot of sexy people in this, uh, on that, right? And then there's the one that's in the cover that we have and it's a, a, a glimpse of things to come. We know that Longshot's on his way, The Brood possibly, and then Omega Red, who we know is right there. And then we get a little bit of sketches from Jim Lee and I love the big inky, the inky works right there. And then of course what's coming up. Like anyway, so there's, there's things to really love about this version, including that cover, but definitely prefer this one. All right. Then we cut back to asteroid M Magneto's got uh, the people that were trying to follow him that had stolen the shuttle them and their captors. They're like having a little bit of a, uh, a conflict, right? Magneto shows up in his Hugh Hefner gear right here. And he's like, yo, I've invited you to my house. Like show some decency as I show you hospitality. But this human guy shoots and I don't think he kills this woman because later on she's referenced as, as still being there, but it straight up looks like she dies. There's that hatching. There's that screen door hatching that we're always talking about in particular with Art Adams and Rob Liefeld, but Jim Lee and Scott Williams, they use it as well. So seeing this act of violence really pisses Magneto off. Magneto throughout this entire thing is being pushed more and more back into villainy. More and more, he's being, he's being pushed in, and put into a corner. Nobody puts Maggie in a corner, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, he just tries, takes out this guy's weapon, breaks his arm, and he's like, y'all, I need you to calm down. He's freaking out. But then Fabian Cortez shows up. I believe this is Fabian Cortez's first appearance. And what's going to happen now, and this will ultimately kind of lead to things like Fatal Attractions, just 25 issues after this. Um, but Fabian Cortez kind of starts getting his ear, or gets, or he starts getting into Magneto's ear. And he starts kind of like manipulating Magneto a little bit to go back into this villainous role, possibly for his own reasons. We'll find this out as this whole series develops. Um, we get the term flat scan, those genetic dead heads, dead ends, unblessed with our mutant abilities. So then we get to the X-Men. Now with the use of Magneto's powers, he's entering the atmosphere. They pick up on it and then they send the blue team after Magneto. Great shot of Beast right here and Wolverine. I love the look of Gambit coming out, not fully dressed, without his little stupid half mask thing there. Psylocke just looks great. The redesigned new vehicle for the X-Men, the Blackbird, very famous design because of this comic and the X-Men animated series um, and the toy, which I have right behind me right now. Magneto goes to basically uh, an oceanic graveyard. So in issue 150 of X-Men, um, there was a nuclear sub from, I think, the USSR that Magneto sinks and kills everybody on board. He finds this, brings it back up from the sea to get a hold of its, its nuclear payload. So now Magneto's got a bunch of nukes. Everybody's freaking out, but Rogue and the rest of the blue team, they show up, try to talk Magneto down. Rogue and Magneto have a past. They got a history. There's some issues that dive into that. We would love to cover it here on the channel, but Magneto's not interested in talking. He just wants, he's at a point right now where he feels like he's, he almost feels like his path into goodness or to the, the side of Xavier, almost like set back the mutant cause for a while. The Blackbird swoops in, he stops it. Beast and Gambit run out another great shot of Beast right there with Gambit trailing on him. Magneto stops Beast. Gambit tries to do something, throws his cards. What a great... See, I bet the coloring... We're going to do this again. All right, so let's compare these pages. I get it. You look at this, and I can very see harsh lines with all these color separations, and just, it looks gaudy, the, the yellow and the, the, the red. Here, it actually gives you the effect that it's supposed to do of energy, high light intensity, uh, flashing at you, almost blinding. Look at actually, they, they colored in, they did color in the, 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 the coat of Gambit right there. That must be a mistake, or it's just trying to show the fiery energy. I love the coloring on this one better. I just noticed that though, His, they didn't color in, I bet that's a mistake that they corrected right there. 
That's interesting. But I love the coloring here on these cards, making them feel very hot and intense, right? Speaking of intense, what about a big kick to the face by Psylocke? Spread open, very sexualized pose, but this was something that my young heart was just soaring at. I loved this stuff. She's about to hit Magneto with her psychic knife, the focused totality of my telepathic abilities. That is a term we're gonna hear so many damn times over the course of this series. And then she gets stopped, Wolverine comes in, freaking out Magneto, because he's like a going for the kill shot. He's going for the kill shot. Cyclops separates the two of them. Magneto goes, and he's surrounded by the corpses of the people who he killed in issue 150. It flashes him back to his experience in the Holocaust. Great moment here of pure terror. If this was bigger and a little bit wider, that's very like Tales from the Crypty EC comics. Then Wolverine still coming in. Magneto is trying to push him away, get him away, because he's freaked out because he's never seen Wolverine come at him with this much furious intensity. All right, and then Rogue, oh, hit, missed a page right there. So there is Magneto taken up with his nukes. Rogue goes to try to stop him. All the other X-Men are freaking out. She's trying to talk to him. She's trying to be like, yo, we used to work together. Because that's the thing, like Cyclops and Beast, they weren't on that team with Magneto, but Rogue and Wolverine, these are characters that Magne Magneto is feeling betrayed by right now, right? So I do really like that dynamic. It is truly a tragic story as far as the return of Magneto back to villainy. She's trying to talk. The humans, they are firing missiles. What a great shot. One of the only moments where you see splatter being used here to show you the chaotic nature of this panel and once again Magneto may be trying to do the benefit of the doubt or giving everybody the benefit of the doubt which is not what they're doing Rogue is trying to do that but nobody else is and then he un he 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 fires off one of the nukes in the high atmosphere causing an electromagnetic pulse that takes out most of the earth's electronics there's an ad for some Chris Claremont novels anybody ever read these if so let me know Right, then we cut back to Asteroid M. Magneto is, like, he's feeling betrayed. You know, he even has, you know, from Cyclops, I expected that. He has never trusted me and never will. But Wolverine, I have fought by his side. For the brief time I worked with the X-Men, he accepted me full, wholeheartedly. If not as a friend, then at least as a comrade in arms. Why then has he turned on me? What has changed? Why must blood always come between me and others? He's coughing. Fabian's using his powers to heal him but also to manipulate him. The X-Men are trying to find Rogue because Rogue's been missing since the nuke went off. Rogue is in Genosha. She recognizes it. We have already covered the Extinction Agenda on Marvel in the 90s. Those will be being released at some point in the future as their own special video and clip here. But there's a reference to the Extinction Agenda. Genosha used to be a mutant-hating uh, slave uh, state, right? But they have tried to do better. But now the Acolytes show up tearing ass through Genosha, coming after Rogue. She's trying to stop him. There's this weird bit here where this dude seems to be one of the humans, right? This dude seems to be like one of the humans from the group. They have this whole discussion about it, but they don't really explain it in this issue. And I don't really remember what the explanation is, to be honest with you, but the Acolytes are there. That's what they're called now. We get the debut of their costumes, really like. It's kind of like a new Brotherhood of Mutants, right? Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. The rest of the X-Men show up, or the blue team show up. What an interesting moment here. So this this chick, who I believe is the chick who died in the in the previous like pages, but anyway, she fires this thing with like a big like bomb or some kind of ballistic shell, some kind of ordnance, right? Gambit snatches it out of the air and throws it back at her. Gambit can do that. How he hasn't done this since. He's not charging it or nothing. He's literally like grabbing this projectile out of the ear, out of the air, and sending it back and blowing up in her face. Then this, this is where we get all the discussion. We get a fire or a firehouse. We get a fastball special here. Wolverine going berserker rage. Psylocke getting in on the action. Really cool dynamic stuff here. Wolverine about to take out Cortez. But then Magneto shows up, another great double page splash. Let's compare this one to how it appears in the glossy edition. Because some of those big moments are really cool to see like that. So 
I mean, you be the judge. You like whichever one you like. I'm not going to hate you for it. But, like, the gradient from purple into pink, I love so much better on this newsprint where it soaks in and kind of gets that through. Um, the, the coat works better for me. The colors on Wolverine's costume. But, you know, I digress. So, Magneto shows up and he's like, look. Asteroid M is now going to be a mutant nation. All are welcome here, but mark this and mark it well. Harm done against any mutant is harm done to me, and I shall respond accordingly. Then we got this bit right here where Banshee's trying to find Moira McTaggart, and she says this terrible thing that's happening. Banshee, it's all my fault. We'll get more about that next time. Some great lettering right there. Probably Orzakowski. And then boom! That's the issue. Look at that great ad for the original line of X-Men figures. So they knew that they wanted to make X-Men a franchise. They were working on an animated series. They did the pilot. We know that as Pride of the X-Men. It is here on YouTube. Watch it. Check it out. We'll be talking about that at some point. They're, they're doing a toy line at the same time. And these toys are based on 80s X-Men designs, right? It's based on X-Factor, right? X-Factor uh, uh, Cyclops right there. Um, it's got the Nightcrawler. There's no Nightcrawler in here. There's no Kitty Pride. They're, they're going to be an Excalibur, right? And then there's a whole new... At this time, there was a whole new thing going on, right? X-Force had just launched. Uh, then we have X-Men. And then we got X-Factor with a whole new direction. So, Pride of the X-Men. These toys, they're all... And even the uh, even the uh, the arcade game that comes out, I think, the very next year, right alongside the X-Men animated series that we know and love... Um, they're based more on this comic, but I love this original toy line. But so, they were already trying to make the X-Men popular. And they were already had plans in motion based on some of the 80s designs and storylines and characters. But this issue right here cements the fact and the notion and idea of what X-Men's going to be in the 90s. The Jim Lee influence on X-Men is straight up 90s X-Men. All the way through, these costumes... These character interactions, some of these stories, um, this is 100% what the X-Men animated series is going to spring forth from and the entire aesthetic of not just the 90s, but just X-Men fandom. Most people my age, this is our X-Men. It starts here. People older than me, it was the stuff right before, but all of it is solid. And this, to me, still is a great, great issue. So Marvel took a property that was already growing in popularity steadily since like 74, 75, right? Had slowly been gaining in popularity. They're trying to make it work in, in, in different media with animated series and video games. Those things are in the works as we speak. Then they launch a new number one. We already had Spider-Man number one sell a million copies. We had X-Force number one sell five million copies. And now we have X-Men number one sell over 8 million copies. Nobody's come close to that yet. Now, doesn't mean they all sold to people. I remember at my comic shop at the time was Jennings, and for years there was still a giant wall of X-Men number ones that you could go and grab at any time. They didn't even file them in back stock. They just had their own section of X-Men number one. And it's an easy comic to find. It's not hard to find, but if you've never read it, highly encourage you to read it. It's awesome. And if you love 90s X-Men, this is really where it all starts. Those new costumes, those new designs, the gold and the blue team, the return of Magneto to the villainy. And what I will say about the writing here is really great at kind of bringing Magneto back to his villainous roots, but doing it in a tragic way. That's what I love about this. The artwork is super awesome, very dynamic, very exciting, and the story's cool too. This whole story goes for three issues. I would love to do issue number two and issue number three. If you want to see that, let me know in the comments down below. And what else? What do you want to see me cover here on the top-down, bottoms-up videos that we're doing here at Pop Culture Philosophers? Thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for watching. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And like I said, comment below. Do you want to see issue two? What other books do you want to see? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you all so much for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station. All right, there's your edition tonight of Marvel in the 90s. Y'all have been wanting to do that one for a long time, and what better excuse than with the new format, top-down, bottoms-up, 
X-Men number one. Hope you enjoyed that breakdown. If you want to see issue number two, let me know. And and I said this for the video, because the video this video will drop probably in like like two or three weeks, something like that. And uh but you saw it here first. But I'll ask the same question. What do you want to see me cover on my top down videos? Let me know. I appreciate y'all. We'll be right back. We're taking a quick break here in Rockin' Robbie Live, Teen Dog Shades Night. When we come back, a little bit of show and tell and a, another bonus top-down sneak peek because of your generosity uh, from Brad and Chocos in particular. Uh, we'll be right back here on Rockin' Robbie Live.
I so hope this part doesn't go in the video where I'm just standing here, staring forwards. That'd be so embarrassing. Hey everybody, welcome back here to Rockin' Robbie Live on a special Easter Sunday presentation of a Teen Dog Shades night. We had a lot of great Teen Dog Shades talk that led into CERN and the Mandela Effect and this, the nature of time and space. And it all started with a little bit of UFO talk and distrust in the government. Hell yeah, that's how we do it here on PCP, uh, on Rockin' Robbie Live, on Teen Dog Shades night. We also did the DC sneak peek and we even did a little bit of Marvel in the 90s with a sneak peek at an upcoming top-down, bottoms-up video. We're about to get into another one of those. But before we do, follow Pop Culture Philosophers on Facebook and on Instagram. And if you're on Facebook, join the PCP Army. That's the official Pop Culture Philosophers Facebook group. You can follow me on Twitter at the Rockin' Robbie. You can find podcasts and more at popculturephilosophers.com. You can save money on certain sites with uh, all that stuff in the description below. Excuse me, links and all that stuff to merch. We got t-shirts, we got mugs, we got all that shit. Um, so that's that's one way to support us. The other way to support us is over at patreon.com slash PCP, which will unlock exclusive audio downloadable versions of the weekly comic book review and the weekly pop culture wrap-up hours before they drop on YouTube. That is available at patreon.com slash PCP. Plus, at some point in April, which starts <clears throat> in just a few hours, um, we will be starting monthly watch-along movie time over at patreon.com slash PCP. That's going to be for the $5 level and up. So get ready for that. That is coming. Um, and so, honestly, like, what movie should we watch together? I'm leaning towards The Crow. Right now, I'm leaning towards the original Crow. I haven't seen that in years and years and years. I've never necessarily been a fan of it. I think that would be a fun one to do. So, I don't know. What do y'all think? What movie should we watch on Patreon live along with each other? Uh, in April. Let me know what you think. Um, looking at your chats here, Rogue was my girl back in the day. She definitely has style. Absolutely. That was a tremendous breakdown, Robbie. Well, thank you, Sticky Ricky. Last G says, I would point out that Herge's 23 issue 1010 series has sold more than 350 million, co 350 million copies. Yeah, that's why I said in the video, the best-selling American comic book. I didn't say European. I didn't say Japanese. I didn't say international. I didn't say graphic novel. I That's why I stuck right to that. Yeah, 8 million copies is phenomenal for a single-issue American comic. But, yes, there are European comics. There are Japanese comics that have outsold that tremendously. And don't even get me started on shit like Dogman. Okay, so I know it's not the highest-selling comic book of all time, period. But it is a very important comic book in its history, so right on. I've never read 1010. I, I, I want to dive into some of that stuff. 
European comics are like one of my weak points. Um, honestly, like I, I know some Mobius, right? Some of those are hard to get, but I really do like collecting the epic collections. And once money's better, maybe I can start getting some more of those. But I, I really do uh, want to dive more into European. I mean, I've read a lot of like 2000 AD collected stuff, you know, so I know a little bit of the UK market, but not everything even there. Um, and even Japanese, like I got a very, like, like, like very narrow uh, manga uh, reading I got a very minor and narrow uh, knowledge of even Japanese comics. So definitely we could all do better there. Great top down. Well, thank you so much. Toys R Us is still in Canada. Oh, yeah. Mary was. Yeah, the, the Toys R Us ad. I mean, yeah, I missed that shit, too. The government can suck an egg. Absolutely. Next one, do Venom, Lethal Protector, anything Mark Bagley. Oh, yeah, that'd be a good one. We could do some new warriors. We could do Venom Lethal Protector. We did that. We covered Venom Lethal Protector on a Comics Revisited, but that was years ago. It was the first one we ever did. I did not know what I was doing. So, yeah, 100%. Anything Mark Bagley, too. Round Robin from the uh, Amazing X-Men days. That would be super, super cool. Um, so, yeah, patreon.com slash PCP, but you can also support the channel with Super Chat which does trigger lots of things. All that support really does help us out. But all we need is you being here, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting, being a part of this conversation. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about cats here on PCP Movie Night. A four-year promise finally comes to fruition. Uh, but let's run through the next few months of PCP Movie Night in case you missed the announcement last week. But tomorrow night is cats. The week after, we're going to be talking about Ridley Scott's Gladiator. The week after that, we'll be talking about Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Right after that, we're going to be talking about the Coen Brothers, A Serious Man, an underappreciated and not talked about uh, Coen Brothers film. That's one of their most personal films. So very excited for that one. And then we're going to end April with Kung Pao, Enter the Fist, where my buddy Clayton, that's right, one of his favorite movies. He's one of my best friends. He's going to come in, and we are going to talk about one of his favorite movies. And then we start Crew's Choice. That's where each member of the crew, or certain members of the crew, get to pick a movie to cover. Because I always pick these movies and curate the lists. But on Crew's Choice, we let the crew do it. Um, including me, but this year it's Cruise Choice, as in C-R-U-I-S-E. They all got to be Tom Cruise movies, so these are still picked by the crew, but they do involve Tom Cruise. My pick is Days of Thunder. This starts in May for my birthday week. After that, we got Brooks's pick of Risky Business. After that, we got Joe Corallo's pick of Legend, The Director's Cut. After that, for Jelani's birthday week, we got Tropic Thunder, which is Jelani's pick. Then we've got Minority Report, that is Fable's pick. Interview with the Vampire was picked by Manny. John Hammertime Holshue picked Oblivion, which is a movie I've never seen. And we're going to end it with Mike the Voice Matthews picking Collateral, a really great film from Michael Mann. But do not miss our Cats review tomorrow night here on PCP Movie Night. All right. Let's see here. Image in the 90s, Alan Moore Wildcast with Travis Cherie, or one of the issues of More Supreme with Chris Sprouse, or you could look at Jim Valentino's biographical miniseries, A Touch of Silver. I'd be down for all of those. In fact, I definitely, I have every issue of Alan Moore's <clears throat> um, Wildcat, so we should definitely go through that. I would love to do that. Fable says, I'd love to get into some UK stuff. Charlie says, I won't be on Patreon as I can't afford it, but maybe watch The Crow. It is actually a great movie and true to the form of the comic, and Disney never got to make it. All right, oh, we got to vote for The Crow right there. Kelvin says, Spriggan animated 1998 movie, Memories 95, Cowboy Bebop movie, Have You Done Blade Runner or Dead Presidents or Predator? We have not done Dead Presidents, but we have done Predator and Blade Runner. So both of those you can search right now. For PCP Movie Night, we had great, great reviews on that one. Kung Pao is absolutely cool. Absolutely, Charlie. Comic book movies, Snowpiercer, The Death of Stalin, Dread or Red. We did Dread recently. We did Dread. It was actually the... Uh, <clears throat> we did it last April. It was uh, the winner of a PCP movie poll. I'm going to get you, sucker. would be so fun. Yeah, Collateral is super. I love that movie. 
Can't wait for the <laughs> the Jelani quotes for cats. Yeah, me neither. Jellicle cats are and jellicle cats we, whatever the fuck. Um, I forgot the lyrics. I, I I had them in my head the other day. I do love cats, like as far as like the stage production. That movie something else. What a fever pitch of movies I watched this week. On night one, I watched Possession. Night two, I watched Cats. Night three, I watched Roadhouse, the new one. Fuck. I am ready for Gladiator. (laughs) All right. You guys have been so nice. It's time for your next sneak peek at a top-down video. We're about to talk about Superman Volume 5, or Volume 2, Issue 51, which happens to be the start of the Triangle Era. But before we get into that, we got American Demon with Super Chat uh, about to head to bed, but it's been a fun watch. Psylocke is Chef's Kiss. I need that issue just for her. Oh, yeah, hell yeah, Psylocke is. Hope you enjoy Envy, though, and good night. Yeah, I'm really excited to dive into it. Thank you so much, my man. It's a, it was a pleasure meeting you and hanging out with you this week, and I'm looking forward to more cool conversations and getting to hang out. I really do appreciate this one. This is for you, my new friend. Where's the button? There it is. Let me tell you about this little man I know His name is Hellboy He was sent to the earth some long time ago To save it or destroy Brought to this earth by Rasputin Son of a demon and a nana who Had a sex with a demon But was raised by Professor Broom and now we fight evil and monsters. Shit! Now we fight with a man who's a fish named A. That means fish, I guess. <laughs> and now he fights with a fire starter. Name Blizz. Don't get, don't forget. And an act of plasmic mess named Yo. Look at the Mario sitting right next to me Don't you see Jason and Rambo? What can they be doing with Uncle Scrooge? Jumping up on his head Man, I really got some Get some new graphics for this bit Yes, yes, I do Don't you know? Can't you see it in my eyes? Oh no, you can't because I'm not telling lies But I've got my Teen Dog shades on And we're going to the moon and I'm back What? Yeah! Love that Hellboy. All right. Thank you so much, American Demon. Love you. You're great. All right, so... Today, Sean came in at just the right time. Yes, she did. Tropic Thunder is freaking awesome, says Billy. That's Jelani's pick. So you can thank Jelani for that one. But we got we got to walk through the shit of cats before we get to the gold. That's going to be Tropic Thunder and Gladiator and Yojimbo and all the other movies that we're going to be talking about. However, in Superman, 1991, started the Triangle Era. Much of us, many of us love it and have a lot of respect for that era of... Superman comics, including me, but I've had this issue in my collection for a long time and never read it. And I read it and I talked about it and let's get into it. Superman's triangle era started right here on DC in the nineties. Hey everybody. Welcome to pop culture philosophers. I'm rockin' Robbie Billups. And today we're taking a look inside Superman volume two issue number 51, which is the start of the famous triangle era for the man of steel. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. Today, we're taking a look inside Superman Volume 2, issue number 51, 
from 1990, um, which has a cover date of January 91. It starts the triangle era of Superman. So Superman was relaunched in 1986, right post-crisis. John Byrne came in. He did the Man of Steel miniseries, which I loved. I read that when I was a kid five years old, but I remember it vividly in my head, loving the Man of Steel stuff. Then he took over Action Comics, made it a team-up book. He had Superman relaunch with the new number one. He eventually left, but there were other creators as well. Adventures of Superman, for instance, was drawn by Jerry, Jerry Ordway. And this book, at this point, by issue 51, because Byrne left in the 20s, right? You're really 22, 23, something like that. Um, so here we got Jerry Ordway as the writer and the penciler here on Superman 51, but it starts the Triangle era where it took all the Superman books and basically made one weekly Superman book out of it. And you could follow the order with this little triangle that would say the year and what number, like what week of the year. So 1991, week one, this is number one to read, right? And it started this whole era of Superman that lasted for years and years and years, all the way through like the 90s, right? So the Superman comics of the 90s are defined by this triangle stuff and like the death of Superman, the return of Superman, the electric blue Superman, the electric red Superman, all of this stuff is kind of tied into this triangle era. So I figured what a fun bit to go and the very first triangle era book, read it, talk about it, and if so warranted, go through the entire Triangle era of Superman, issue to issue. I can do that because I love Superman and I got a lot of Superman comics, so let's do that. First thing I want to talk about is this awesome cover. This is an amazing cover that is completely done by Jerry Ordway. Did he do the coloring? Um, it is colored by Jerry Ordway too, so the, the penciling, the inking, and the coloring, and what I love about this cover in particular is the duo shade. Y'all know me, you know I'm a big fan of duo shade, something that was really highlighted in those early Eastman and Laird Turtles books, but the use of the duo shade here works, the colors work. It's an interesting image that definitely has me excited to see what happens in the pages of this book. Unfortunately, what happens in the pages of this book I don't really like that much. I think I think it's uh I think it's an okay comic. I was kind of disappointed. All right. So we got Jerry Ordway on art and story, Dennis Janke on the inking, Glenn Whitmore on the coloring, John Costanza on the lettering. Now, at this time, DC was known to kind of be you know, at this time Marvel's got Jim Lee, they got Rob Liefeld, they got Todd McFarlane, they got really exciting art. Now, Jerry Ordway is a great artist, and he's a great classic artist. His style is really appropriate for a book like Superman. But compared to the Marvel books that were going on at the time, this is a snooze fest. It is by the numbers, typical comic book art, simple, super. Okay, we get our first shot of Superman. Now here's a, the debut of a new era, right? The triangle era of Superman. Now they didn't necessarily know what it was going to become or the, the, the respect and the reference that us fans have for this era of Superman. But man, what a whack-ass start, to be honest with you, right? So the first time we even see Superman, he's just like holding these dudes, walking in some water. There's like a radioactive leak or something. There's a flood. So like these, the cooling liquid that's around these, these rods in this nuclear reactor, it all gets messed up. Superman's there saving these people. But like what I'm saying is, this is the first moment you see Superman in the brand new triangle era and there's cool stuff in there like like i can't tell if that's screen that's got to be screen tone you're not going to use a whole page of duo shade for that that's totally screen tone so you got the screen tone you got the stuff like that it's fine the coloring's decent enough i like the use of the purples in this issue and those blues it's typical of the of the era and i do like that coloring but man it's just boring like this does not put superman in a perspective where we can be awed by it, right? So Superman's just carrying these dudes out. You get a little bit of a, one of the, you know me, I always talk about how I love the original coloring on newsprint so much better than when they do it on glossy paper or when they remaster it in glossy paper. Like, they they got a, for instance, they got an, a, an omnibus coming out of 
the Superman triangle era, and they're probably going to be on glossy paper, and we will be able to look and see how these colors are going to be gaudy. So I think the colors work. Some of the choices are a little bit muddy. Here's so all like seems like one, like here it pops. Other times, the colors themselves are fine, but the choices made, they don't all work. And it's a rather mundane book, right? But one of the faults of newsprint is that sometimes you would get this really thick, overproduced line and that happens in some of the pages here it has nothing to do with the original art it has everything to do with the printing right where maybe it would use too much black ink and it would soak it up too much or something like that so superman takes these dudes to safety he goes in he's got to take he's sucking the water up in a straw putting it back to cover the cooling rods i mean it's a dumb hokey kind of use of superman's powers there's a much more dynamic way that you could show this and other artists would have done it. But Jerry Ordway, he's just painting by the numbers. He's getting the, the paycheck. He's doing his thing. So it's an interesting enough opening. We find out some interesting things. And at the beginning of the Triangle Era, Lex Luthor is presumed dead. We'll find out that that's not necessarily the case. He actually reclones himself. Um... Or I should say he clones himself at, and he, he starts a new life as his own son, Lex Luthor II. But he died from like kryptonite radiation poisoning, I believe, from wearing that ring, the kryptonite ring. So Superman is talking about how like, I mean, it's so cheesy, you know. He's like, not so fast, mister. This wasn't just a mishap. Had I not been here, this could have been a major catastrophe. I assure you this will be brought up to my superiors. You do that, doctor. I'll take my recommendations to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Such cheesy, hokey, Boy Scout type stuff. But he runs out of uh, LexCorp, which is where this is all happening. Goes out into space to expel the extra radiation on him. Comes back to Earth. Then we clip to a, a hotel, or a, an airport, I should say. Airport where this mysterious dude shows up. Seems like he's hypnotizing everybody. Just look at the art. I mean, it's fine. It gets the job done. But let's take ourselves back to 1990, where you got Jim Lee on Uncanny X-Men where you've got uh, Rob Liefeld on New Mutants, where you've got Todd McFarlane in Spider-Man. Like, it's, it's just, this isn't comparable. It's just not comparable. It's static, it's stiff, and it's not exciting. It's not exciting at all, right? So this dude shows up, he's from Romania. We don't really know who he is, but he's able to, like, hypnotize people, mesmerize people. So that's going on. He's looking at the paper. Then we cut to Cat Grant and her boyfriend, Jose. This is picking and building up of a subplot that must have been in here before. Now, as much as I love and have read multiple times the John Byrne era, everything between John Byrne and here, I haven't really read, right? And I don't, I've never even actually read this comic. This is the first time I've read it, though I've had it in my collection for years. But Jose's talking about how Cat's never wanted for money. He's never had money. Things are weird. A lot of melodramatic, soap operatic bullshit. And it's fine. You know, that's what this triangle era of Superman is, is it's melodramatic. It's soap operatic. It's carrying these threads through. He goes to buy a lottery ticket. The lottery prize is $14 million. Um, he The ticket, he, he grabs this ticket, puts it in his pocket. Meanwhile, this dude who's from Romania shows up. He's trying to get mugged. These dudes are trying to mug him. And he winds up, this is a cool little bit. He's like, your friend is fast, no? His heart powerfully pumping into his muscles. Can you visualize it? His heart pumping and pumping. So he, he creates this visualization of his heart, and it's used with this nice, like, color hold uh, effect right here, and some cool, like, textured um, screen tone being used here, but with the printing, almost like the overprinting of the black ink, it just doesn't quite come across as clear. But Marvel had the same problem in this era. As much as I love the coloring on the newsprint, Sometimes the line work does get a little bit fuddy, but he winds up killing this dude um, just by visualizing his heart beating and stopping and being crushed. Dude's like, what did you do to my friend? Cat's boyfriend, Jose, shows up. Is this the dude that becomes Peacemaker? Not Peacemaker, Crime Buster? Is this the dude? I don't know, but he's got an ugly brown-orange coat or whatever. While he's trying to help these dudes, and he's like, no, your friend's dead. The lotto ticket pops out of his pocket and back to Bibbo, right? So Bibbo's a character that we're definitely going to come to know and mostly love here. All right, we cut to the Daily Bugle. Perry White's been a hard ass on everybody because his son recently died. He admits that he's been a hard ass. He needs to take some time off, and he's going to have a new replacement for editor-in-chief, managing editor of the Daily Bugle, and it's this dude, Sam. 
I don't know who the hell this is, but the, all this stuff, Superman, or my bad, Clark Kent, who we know is Superman, starts getting this wave of nausea or something, and it's this it's this dude from, Roman from Romania, like, contacting him telepathically, so he leaves to go confront this era, or to go confront this dude, who we know from the cover is Mr. Z, the menace of the mysterious Mr. Z, so he takes off his, his suit, gets his Superman costume going, classic moment, but could have been done in a more d dynamic way. Like, it's kind of boring. The art's very boring. Superman's shown walking so much and, like, show Superman flying, show Superman soaring, show the speed, show the intensity of it, show the power of Superman, right? But he winds up going to this museum. This dude's set up. He's like, yo, we met during World War II. This, I don't know if this gets picked up on or referenced later on, but it just... He's like, his accent is distinctly European. Superman's trying to figure it out. The dude shows up. So he's got this cane with this, like, gemstone on it. And he sucks Superman's essence into this gemstone. So what he does is, this dude's like an immortal. Mr. Z, right? He's an immortal. It's like Mr. Belvedere is your fucking villain for Superman. Like, come on, get rid. You notice all the uh, Nintendo and, and video game ads? Video games are really taking over everything here so he captures superman's essence what he does is throughout history people that are interesting to him because he leads a lonely immortal life he captures them in his gemstones so he can converse with them as he pleases so he meets these people from different eras of earth's history they're all having a chat it's boring there's this one dude there who doesn't want he's not cool with it they, they fight all of a sudden everything starts shaking and trembling superman realizes because I'm Kryptonian, his gemstone is based in earth magic. So since I'm Kryptonian, it's messing it up. So I'll start speaking Kryptonese and it blasts the gemstone apart and frees Superman, allowing all these other spirits that have been trapped in there to escape and actually move on to the afterlife to die or something like that. And then Superman, nice little color hold, little effect right here where Superman goes back into his body. But... The Mr. Z is now in some kind of a trance. I supposed he was immortal. Well, I'd say you got that one wrong. This dude's deader than a doornail. And then a body in the morgue gets up and walks away. And it's this dude again. And he's taken on the name George Bailey, like the guy in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, yes, Wonderful Life indeed. And that's it. That's your story. That's this book. That's what happens. It, it's It's dull. It's boring. It's not exciting. Splatterhouse, what a great video game, by the way. TurboGrafx-16, never had one of those. I had a friend that had one, and that game was gnarly. Um, this is a boring comic. It's really dull. The art and the story. The art, you know, Jerry Ordway's a classic artist. I really do like Jerry Ordway's style. I've met Jerry Ordway. I got him to sign one of his first Adventures of Superman's comics that he did. I got him to sign his Power of Shazam number one. I love Jerry Ordway's work. But this story and the art and the way that Superman's being portrayed here, it's just boring. It's dull. I like some of the colors that are utilized, but the choices themselves, I mean, there's some pages where it works. I love the light blue and the, the lavender right there. Very, like I said, typical of the time. But for the most part, it's dull. Nothing breaks a panel. Like, this is the most dynamic interesting shot we get is something like that you got this side story stuff that's interesting nice use of screen tone here and there but overall it's a boring static stiff comic where it's literally mr belvedere is the first villain of superman's new triangle era luckily there's more exciting dynamic comics to come i'm sure when i was a kid i loved superman in this era but man what a what a sad start to this. I mean, there's some, like I said, Jerry Ordway, he draws the figure nice. He knows anatomy. It's all nice. And I know that we say certain things, like maybe Todd McFarlane doesn't know anatomy. Maybe uh, the figure work of of uh, Jim Lee is, 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 is suspect, you know, not quite real, or the same thing with Rob Liefeld, but they knew how to make exciting comics, and even these kind of moments, like, it's just Superman feels boring and dull and old school, and... You know, I've heard this said before, but in this era where you got Marvel and that explosion they're having with what who are going to be the, the image founders, 
Superman felt like dad's comics. Superman felt like your grandfather's comic. This felt so old school that it had no connection to the youthful audience that was reading comics at this time. So it just, it didn't necessarily work then, and it's not necessarily working now. 100%. I did not like this comic, but I'm excited to keep going through the Triangle era because I do have fond memories of this, and I know that a couple years later, when they're finally trying to catch up and they're pulling big things out like weddings and deaths and funerals for friends and all that kind of stuff, like, maybe we can find a little bit more enjoyment. But man, this was a dull, stiff, stagnant, boring comic that I did not like. But I'm glad it's still a part of my collection. Glad I got to read it. Glad I got to talk with you here. Do you want more Triangle Era of Superman? What's your recollections of the Superman Triangle Era? What do you think about this issue in particular? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at patreon.com slash pcp if you want to help support the channel. Um, I've been rocking Robbie Billups. <laughs> Keep on reading. Keep on loving. And uh, station pop, pop, boom, y'all. Yeah, I was, I was disappointed in that. I was disappointed in that, and I didn't go too fucking, fucking hardcore into it. So let me do that here. And I saw a comment. Somebody asked, "What's the triangle era of Superman?" I guess I didn't do a good enough job in that video to kind of like mention that so the triangle era of superman is where you have all these superman books and they basically come out once a week right so there's adventures of superman there's superman there's uh action comics and eventually there's going to be man of steel they launch a new uh, superman book out of this right and so it, it, it basically comes down to the fact that there's a superman book every single week going across the four titles on weeks or months with five weeks there's usually an extra size special edition they eventually start doing uh man of tomorrow to fill in some of that stuff and then eventually specials so the idea is that every week you get a superman comic that is a piece of a puzzle and the triangle would have the year and a number the the number of the week so 1990 one one right and then next week's issue of like whatever this next like adventures of superman would have the two on it so that way you could go through and actually read them and and each book was done by a different team and they would have their own threads and subplots but they'd also string it through so instead of having four superman books that felt very disconnected these books felt very connected and and i love this kind of thing they did the same thing with batman in the no man's land era where Batman with basically four different books of Batman with some specials here and there became a weekly Batman ongoing comic, right? They did it different in the No Man's Land because they would block it out. So like if there was a four issue story, it would run from Batman to Detective to Legends of the Dark Knight to Shadow of the Bat. And then it would start over with the new writer, new team, new story kind of all together. I liked that approach. This one though, each book had its own team, but they were all working very good. And it's it's one of those things where editorial uh, direction and communication between the creators actually wound it up, ended up making a very cohesive narrative through line from week to week. And it made people that were Superman fans buy Superman every week. Right. And, and I love that era, but what a bogus ass start. Mr. Fucking Belvedere. Is your fucking villain. All right. It's been said many times that Superman's got some of the worst villains. He doesn't have a good rogues gallery. Blah, blah, blah. No, he does. The problem is shit like this. Like, Superman's got Lex Luthor. Brainiac. Doomsday. Doomsday hadn't been in invented yet, but there you go. Darkseid, who they didn't really use as much back then as they do now. But let's think of it. Lobo, right? Um, Brainiac. Metallo. Parasite. Fucking... There are good villains for Superman. And we get Prankster and Mixius Pitalik, and not in a good way. Like, Mixius, Mixie can be good in certain ways when the writer has imagination, but usually it's just fucking stupid. Who wants to watch fucking Toy Man fucking take on Superman, right? Like, the only time that I thought the Toy Man shit was interesting was when Toy Man killed Cat Grant's son, which is part of the Triangle Era, which we covered here on DC in the 90s a few weeks ago. It's fucking boring as shit. It's dog shit is what it is. It sucks. <laughs> this sucks. Now, we'll see 
how it goes. If you guys want to see more Triangle Era stuff, I, I want to go through it. I think that could be a fun experiment. So, anyway, there you go. <laughs> Panic in the Sky, great Triangle Superman arc. There is good stuff. It does get better. But it starts pretty fucking rough. I mean, that's that's a dumb-ass story, y'all. The story's fucking dumb. The artwork is is boring. And and the, the book just sucks. I'm sorry. And I love you, Jay. I love you, Jay. I really do. And I hope... And don't worry. We will do top-downs of Superman comics that I enjoy. But this wasn't it. Everybody's... Ladies and gentlemen, coming soon, Superman versus hypnotizing Mr. Belvedere. Get the fuck out of here. That's stupid as shit. We're talking about the era where... A fucking lizard is like goddamn eating people and shit like that. We're talking about Jim Lee on X Men. I mean, we just did X Men number one, right? And now we're, we just did that. And it's like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> anyway, time for show and tell. For show and tell, I didn't really pick up anything new lately. Money's been tight. However, I wanted to show some toys I have that are still on card from the 90s. A variety of things. Phantom Menace toys. When they started, dude, I was all over them. There's a Darth Maul right there. I still... This is one of my favorite Star Trek cards is the Episode 1 card. I was so sold on Episode 1 before I saw it. Um, Even though... And when I came out of the theater on that, I actually enjoyed it. I still enjoy Phantom Menace. Attack of the Clones is where it really started fucking losing me. But... I like Phantom Menace. I love Darth Maul. I love those toys. They're very nostalgic. How about the first Spawn toy on card right there, y'all? This is still my favorite Spawn toy of all time. Is the first one. I don't know. Spawn 3 is pretty fucking badass. How about this Ash figure? Character created by our friend, friend of the show, Jimmy Palmiani, as well as Joe Quesada. You know... I was I had Jimmy on the show one time and he mentioned, you know, there's an Ash action figure. And I was like, man, I wish I had it. And then Mike the Voice Matthews found it for me. So there's the Ash action figure. Y'all know I'm a big Blade fan. I believe this is the very first Blade action figure. It's from the Spider-Man animated series, the Vampire Wars arc. But there is the first Blade figure. I have it on card because I try to buy every Blade figure I can get my hands on. And I do keep them on card because I just love this fucking character. This is honestly one of my favorite characters. Blade, Night Thrasher, uh, Mr. Fantastic, Iron Man, War Machine in particular. Uh, speaking of Iron Man, how about that Hulkbuster armor? This is, I believe, the first action figure of the Hulkbuster armor from the Iron Man animated series. Part of the Marvel Action Hour. Right there. So... I open most of my toys, but some of my 90s stuff I keep on card. And in fact, I prefer two, one to rock, one to stock, all that kind of bullshit. But, man, I love that shit. Get that baby sign. Which one? The Ash figure? Or the Darth Maul one? Hey, Joe Corallo's in the house. Bro, Joe, I hope you're ready for tomorrow night. Cats. I got some fucking thoughts about that one, brother. Let me, t- let me tell you about that. Uh, Bizarro is so misunderstood. Yeah, Bizarro. That's, I mean, they're great Superman villains, and they're giving us Mr. fucking Belvedere with psychic powers from Romania? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> and we're talking about the era of Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, and Todd McFarlane. Like, what a joke. What a fucking joke. I mean, when I was growing up, no, it was not cool to read DC books unless it was Batman. It wasn't even cool to read Batman at, the, at that time. Like, honestly, it wasn't even that cool to read Batman at that time. (sighs) Joe says, I saw Cats opening week and I've been fucking ready. (laughs) Oh, yeah, get the ass figure. Next time Jimmy's at a show, I wonder, is he at Heroes? I should bring it to Heroes. Be like, bruh, I got it. (laughs) I remember talking about it with him. I was like, dude, there was an ass figure. I got to get a hold of that. And I sure did. Ray Park doesn't get enough love for his characters he did, I think. Yeah, like Toad. Maybe that's the reason, Sean. (laughs) 
Joe says, Phantom Menace, at the very least, had some actual physical sets unlike the next two movies. That is true. I, I do like the third one, but the second one. I don't... Is, the thing that I don't like about the second one, by the way, is fucking... All the Anakin Padme shit is insufferable. Insufferable. It's like reading a Superman comic from 1990. <laughs> hey, what's up, chill out, man? How you doing? I don't think I have any Ash comics anymore, man. I need to I need to get a hold of some. Also, for uh, show and tell, last week we shared the Amazon PCP Studio upgrade. Somebody did get me the uh, connectors that I did need. I don't know who sent these, these to me, but whoever did, thank you so much. We can now have movie watch-alongs. Which we're going to start on Patreon, and I'll go ahead and officially announce that the first movie we're going to be covering and watching is The Crow. And... We're going to be watching the fucking VHS, y'all. We're going to be watching the VHS of The Crow. So get ready. Get your Crow movies ready. And we're going to watch along together at some point in April, towards the end of the month, but we're going to get it set up. Hey, what's up, Steph? How you doing? DC needed to combat the energy and bombasticness of Image, and they chose the snotty butler, snooty butler. Um, Image was still two years away, but those dudes were killing it over at Marvel at that time. Honest question for you, Robbie. Five big stories I need to read. You tell me a list, and I will be getting those and reading them first. Sean, I don't know what you've read and what you haven't. So let me just do this. Planetary. East of West. Miracle Man, Sandman, that's an obvious one, so I'll give you six. Miracle Man, Planetary, East of West, Sandman, Preacher, Preacher, Invisibles. There you go. But before you read Invisibles, read Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol, read Rachel Pollock's Doom Patrol. Invisibles isn't just something to jump into, but Planetary, 100%. If you've never read Planetary, I recommend it to everybody here. East of West, I recommend to everybody here. Preacher, if you're feeling nasty. Sandman, for sure. The Invisibles, if you are ready for it. And Miracle Man. How about that? How about that? Name Changer says, I second East of West. So good. Yes, it is. It's absolutely good. That's the book to get you to understand why I love Jonathan Hickman so much. The world building in that shit is so amazing. The pacing, how you take characters, leave them sitting for a while, bring them back, all this kind of fucking complex shit. It's what Game of Thrones wishes it was. That's exactly it. Steph says, Planetary and East of West. Fuck yeah. All right. Now it's time for your official final five. All right. We're going through the Marvel masterpieces by Joe Jusco. How about that right there? Green goblin. What a fucking dope ass card that is. Absolutely amazing. Then we got ghost rider. Another great ass card. I love the hell out of these, the Marvel masterpieces. Then we've got Iron Man. This one could be better. I feel like he was phoning it in on that one, to be honest with you. Uh, I love this card because it's Fantastic Four member, but it's Invisible Woman. Sexy ass Sue. That's what they called her in high school. And then we've got Iceman. Pretty cool. I love the, uh, the detail on the ice slide. That's really great. All right, so my favorite from this batch is definitely the Green Goblin. And in the previous one, for our first five... It was the iconic Hulk image. And I will say that for tonight, the winner is the Green Goblin. Just a great composition. I love the spider uh, background. I love the pumpkin bombs. I love the look, the, in the insanity that's on the face. of I guess, I, I guess it's Norman, because on the back... No, it's Harry. But on the back, it's the first appearance of Green Goblin, but it's Norman Green Goblin that they're showing on the back. But it was Harry at this time. So I guess that's Harry, but they still reference it, reference the, the Norman issue. But that's fine. That's cool. Why not? I mean, who's like a stickler for that shit, you know? Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's Rockin' Robbie Live, Teen Dog Shades Night. Happy Easter. Hope everybody had fun. Man, it was absolutely fantastic. 
Sean says, I'll be blunt. I started reading in 2015, so most big stories you could tell me I haven't read yet. Civil War is the most recent one. All right, well, Planetary, East of West, Sandman, Preacher, Miracle Man, Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol. So there you go. All right. So happy Easter. Hope y'all had a good one. Uh, y'all been great tonight. This has been one of the most fun Teen Dog Shades nights I've had in a while. I'm going to dive into some of that CERN shit. And uh, we'll bring the Teen Dog Shades back in not too long from now. All right. Y'all are the best. Don't forget, tomorrow night we're going to be talking about cats here on the channel. Very excited for that PCP movie night. It's been four years in the making. And it's worth it. Because you're worth it. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you for the support. We love you. Read some great comics. Make some great content. And uh, just fucking be dope, y'all. Keep on reading. Keep on loving. Station. Pop, pop. Motherfucking boom.
Recording. We're recording. Hey, gang. <coughs> So we're going to open up an action figure here. Uh, I'm into Transformers toys really big. So I finally got an Ironhide. I got this a while ago, actually, but I've never opened it. I missed out on the original Earthrise Ironhide, but I got the Studio Series. Lots of cool news for Studio Series coming up. So we're going to open this up. Ironhide is definitely needed for my Autobot collection. G1-inspired... Transformers 86 movie inspired Iron Hide. Let's get into it. Let's take them out. Move that there for now. There he is, nestled in his background, which is super cool. I got to put those backgrounds together. Ooh, that could have been dangerous. I totally tried to do that the wrong way. Could have gotten my finger. Don't trust me with knives. Y'all have literally seen me cut myself on this motherfucking show. I'm trying to open a toy. Cut away from you, Robbie. All right, we got Ironhide. Ironhide was an interesting G1 model. He didn't really look like this like he did in the cartoon. He looked weird in his alt mode, but... This... 
looks pretty fucking dope. Now, a lot of the new G1 Transformers, they no longer use this translucent glass, and that's kind of pissing me off, but they're still doing it there. So there's Ironhide right there. I'll learn to transform him. We'll show him off again at some point on a Figgy Friday. But very important to me to have Ironhide in the collection. I got a ratchet on the way, so very excited for that. I need a Prowl like a motherfucker. Now, I know that they did an Ironhide and Prowl 2-pack recently, but they were battle damage. I don't want that. I want a fucking proper Prowl. They keep fucking re-releasing Jazz instead of Prowl, which pisses me off. I need a Prowl. I need a Mirage. But I have an Ironhide. Looks nice. Very cool. So yeah, check that out. How cool is that? How cool is that? It's fucking dope. Transformers, more than meets the eye. And you know what? One more fucking thing. I ordered some McDonald's. I had some McDonald's earlier, right? Because I wanted to have a bit here. I had planned for a bit here tonight where I was going to try that new McDonald's anime-inspired fucking sauce. It's supposed to be like ginger and tart and all that shit. So I got some chicken nuggets. I got back home. I looked in the bag, and guess what? No fucking nugget sauce. Get the fuck out of here. That shit pisses me off. I'm so fucking mad about it. I'm upset because I'm supposed to be doing a taste test right now of this new McDonald's sauce. And they didn't fucking, they didn't fucking give it to me. I am going to give them a very strongly worded fucking email and give them a taste of my fucking mind. Which is 